Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. What's happening, everybody? Back with another great one. We bring good fighters. We've been managers. We bring everything. Right now, we got another good one. Good people who, the third man in the ring, people who make the stuff happen, good referees, legendary Larry Landless. Larry, how the hell you been, man? I'm doing great. Thank you. Cool, man. Cool. Now, um, just, uh, I know we all got a lot going on here. We've been around the sport for a long time. We've ventured out. I'm doing like a lot of bare knuckle commentary with the BKFC, which I love. Super excited with that. A lot of fun. Got my uh, lights out bourbon going on there. But uh, what do you got going on now? Well, uh, I'm coaching wrestling at a high school, my old alma mater, coaching wrestling. I'm loving it. I'm the head coach now and uh, taking care of, you know, I had to take a little time off refing from November till now just to focus on coaching. Larry, I don't, I don't think anybody understands. I helped do some, uh, some high school wrestling coaching as well. It's a full time. I mean, it, we were off about one month a year. It is nonstop, constant, always two a day practices. Sometimes I don't think anybody understands the amount of dedication. I mean, probably coaching anything nowadays, I would think, but especially wrestling. That is all encompasses every part of your life. Yeah, it's it's a tough one, man. I'm single, so it's it made a lot of sense for me to just knuckle down now. You know, when when you're married before I was married and it was very difficult to coach and ref and to uh, all that, you know, run a team. And yeah, it was, that was a rough one. Oh, and, and Mike, do you notice how he said knuckle down? Is he trying to get <clears throat> in with the, 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 the bare knuckle? I mean, he's, he's throwing little, little shit things and I like it. Knuckle down, <laughs> knuckle down. Lucky. I love it. He'll put in a toe the line, you know, he's going <laughs> to. <laughs> so, yeah. I it was a rough one. It's not, it's not for all, you got to find a partner that's 100% committed to, to it or else there's going to be lifestyle, a lifestyle, man. It's a oh, lifestyle. God, you, you're married to that sport. You're married to it. It's a, it's, and it's a jealous mistress. 100%. Very it would be unforgiving. The greatest B I T C H in the world. If you don't give it enough time. Oh Yeah. Uh, big time. So you're at Mark Keppel High School, and yes. you guys have had a degree of success on your wrestling program. I think you had a state runner-up. Mm. Would you mind opening up on that? Yes. This year, my heavyweight girl is the first person from Mark Keppel High School in 30 years to make it to state, and she took second. And uh, she she's wonderful. Allie Phillips, she'll be at the Nationals in Virginia Beach this week. The last time was my last year at Keppel 30 years ago. Anthony Valencia won state and then won the high school nationals. So and then you, I left. Will you be out there in Virginia Beach this week? Unfortunately, no. She's gonna go with her club team on this one. And uh I'm gonna stay home. I was gonna say we got we got bare knuckle in, in Norfolk. So if you're gonna be around, I was gonna have you come on out. Oh, I could have hit two birds with one stone literally. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Man, so I'm sorry. So I'm, uh, regards to my plugs, uh, I work for Ignite Fights right here in Minnesota, Indiana, Illinois, and I'm I'm gonna be working for the Anthony Pettis Fighting Championship April 25th on UFC Fight Pass. So I'm gonna be doing commentary. So Larry Landless, obviously legendary referee. You started in San Gabriel High School was your first gym. Am I correct? Yes. Um. What year? Yes, that was that was my first show. What was your first year? It was your first gym as well, correct? Um, yes, we well actually, um, my, I had a gym at the boys club, and then um, we eventually moved it to the high school because it was just easier. I was working there, and uh, we hosted a uh, a pancreas fight. In fact, Tito Ortiz's first fight was at that show. He Stop. had, uh, yeah, and I promised him I'd never show the video because he said he'd sue me, but I, I told him I wouldn't. He'd have to threaten me. Uh, but uh, 
Yeah, he fought on my show and uh, he beat my guy pretty badly. And then not too long after that, he fought his first UFC show. Really? Wow. So you do you still have that video? Uh, yes, but I will not I will not show it unless I have his permission. I promised him and I always keep my word. Um, I don't know why he won, but you know I was gonna he, he, he's a businessman. He wants, you know, I can't just make show it and then make money off it. Um, you know, he's a businessman. I respect it. You know, this is his you you only got a small window of opportunity to uh make the most of things. And, uh, you know, Tio is a good guy. He's always been good to me. I consider him a friend and, um, I love his wife. Amber's awesome. So, you know, all but nothing but respect. I would never show it unless he gave me permission. I got a question. When you first watched him fight back then, do you think, man, this guy has something special? Was he just a tough, another tough wrestler who didn't know the sport at the time? He, my guy, Jay Martinez is a, is a pretty tough guy. He's good in jujitsu. He trains with Eric Paulson full time now, but uh, he was a tough guy and he was a second and he played second in state and college, junior college. Um, and Tito just handled them. I mean, it was, I, I didn't expect that. Tito just physically handled them. And um, where was Tito training at, at the time? Uh, probably in bars and streets. And <laughs> he, he <laughs> was, was, he with, was he with tanks? <laughs> Yes, he was actually, he's, okay. the way I met Tito was through uh, Paul Herrera. Paul Herrera was his high school wrestling coach, and I knew Paul from back in the day, and that's how I met Tank Abbott. So, you know, they all got together in Huntington Beach, and uh, Tito was a sparring partner to my understanding, and then they had a little falling out, and, um, <clears throat> you know, Tito kind of went his own way away from Tank. So, yeah, I don't like to get into their personal stuff. Tank, that, Tank cut a couple of promos on that before Tito became Tito. And when Tito became Tito, Frank went, or Tank even went even harder. But you had mentioned Paul Herrera. We're talking early California mixed martial arts. Paul Herrera and Tito Ortiz did the Hitman Fight Productions. I reffed it. Okay. So, Chris, I mean, obviously you know, but the people at home, if they're listening, this was when we've had multiple guests on saying what's found online absolutely did not happen. I won the fight or I lost the fight, but this wasn't the submission of this thing get knocked out. And it was because they had to submit the results ahead of time in order to pretend <laughs> that they were shooting a movie. Yeah. Well, the, the first one they did was out in the desert somewhere. Was that the one you did? Or was it at the, at his, uh, in that, um, Arena in that uh, uh, old theater. In the old theater, they had like the police and a commission come. We've had Chelsea. Oh Stone no, talk no, about that it. wasn't his show. That was um. Oh, what's his name? He he fought Frank Shamrock in Super Bowl and John Lober. Okay, John Lober. Yeah, that was the police one. I was there, and they had the undercover camera and Paul, and then um. Uh, John Lober kind of walks out and because they knew they were they were trying to get rid of him. So they put on like a little exhibition thinking that the camera and they just hit the camera and they ended up filming it. And, T and Tito beat. Um, oh, God. Um, a friend of mine's brother. Beat him in like pretty easily, quick. <clears throat> and I didn't expect him to fight. In fact, he shouldn't have. He was underweight and. But, but but they had to pretend that they were shooting a movie in order yes. to pull the event off. All right. Yeah. Walking into this, <laughs> I mean, you're preparing for a fight. You're preparing your guys to get ready. All right, guys, you got to pretend like we're shooting a movie. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's kind of like there's a lot of hurdles you have to jump in order to make this happen. Those early days was the wild wild west when i started the pancreas thing i was incorrectly told this is before i was hooked up with any athletic commission someone had told me and they brought me up like a page out of the athletic commission book something about pro wrestling that you could slap people in the face and strike the body and kick the body as long as you don't strike the face or the head 
And we thought, oh, that's cool. You could slap them, but you can't punch them. So we had seen that pancreas from Japan. And we thought, okay, we could do this. Let's do it. And we didn't know any better. God darn, if something would have happened, we would have yeah. been in serious trouble. We had no legal leg to stand on. We didn't even have a doctor at these shows. I mean, it was <laughs> some guy showed up one time. I remember he was a dentist. Close and enough. They, passed, they passed him off as a doctor. And I'm like, yeah, there's been some strange stuff. Hey, you'd probably better off with a dentist there anyway. Teeth getting knocked out instead of a doctor. I mean, close enough. <laughs> well, but the thing I started to worry about because some of, the show, <laughs> some of the shows I did were on some Indian reservations and they like recruited people the night before or sometimes straight out of the audience. Ooh. No shit. They go to a bar and they recruit who wants to fight each. And I don't like this guy. I'll fight him. And I had this one dude, he was an Indian. And he lived there on theirs, and he was, man, he had done some snort and some whatever else. His heart rate was, the doctor told me that his heart rate was through the roof. And I was like, well, why are you letting him, why are you letting him fight? He goes, I have to. And I'm all shit. That's, if he dies he goes, on my watch, that's going to make me look bad. The doctor goes, he's just, I'm just a dentist. <laughs> What do I care? <laughs> what do I know? I'm a, I'm a veterinarian. I'm a, shit. I'm a tooth doctor. <laughs> he was a veterinarian, man. I was, I was like, dude, don't, don't put this on me. And, you know, the guy went down quick because uh, his heart, his, his blood pressure was close to five something. Uh. So he just, he, he, he was just, the bubbles were already showing in when he was looking at his opponent. So he, the guy put two on him and he went down. I just stopped it. Yeah. Yeah. I just it, stop it. I don't I don't give a shit. They could boo me all they want. I Larry, how did you become a referee? I mean, I mean, I remember back in the day me showing up at fights and them saying you're a referee. You know what I mean? I, I mean, did you ever do anything any legal that, training or anything like that? That's that's what I did. I showed up to to Rumble and they asked me to fight. <laughs> but, I had a Rumble on the Rock. Doing, I, I, well, Rumble on the Rock came after I was ready in the UFC. Okay. What was the I'll first be, organization you refereed for? Uh, organized? Like, organized? The first time you ever refereed. Um, well, I had already done my shows. Okay. I've done, I had done two or three of my shows, and I met a guy named Ryan Chenoweth at one of my shows, and he was doing neutral grounds grappling. Neutral grounds. He had a cage in his backyard and he invited me and I was, I went down just to like check it out. And he had me ref it because he had grappling and he had pancreas fights. So I ref <laughs> the pancreas fights. Joe Charles was one of the fighters. I remember and, Joe Charles. And the grapplers trip out on this was Rico Rodriguez and uh, Dean Lister. Oh, wow. Dean of, uh, Rico Rodriguez wore black tights and a, and a gi. And um, he, he was just bullying Dean. But, uh, you know, that's a big size difference. But, yeah. you know, also, too, Rico's no, he ain't no slouch when it comes to jiu-jitsu. Oh, very talented. Very talented. Yeah. So and it was jiu-jitsu. It was a jiu-jitsu match, grappling. So I did some pancreas fights and they did in between grappling. And I remember looking in the audience and the Gracies were there and there was some names there. There was some people there, uh, Fabiano Iha and nice. I'm like, and that was all, and it was raining and he put a big tarp over the cage and people were just huddled around. He must've had like almost 200 people back there. Oh, okay. Nice. So you, you mentioned a couple of things. Here. Let me kind of break it down a little bit. You mentioned okay. you ref your own events. It was for called rock and lock events. Am I correct? Oh God. Uh, th th please don't quote me on that. Somebody threw that title on. I I never like, I was okay, whatever. I don't know who. Okay. You were the promoter. Do you yeah. had those in like parking lots and like places like where the cops wouldn't come. Am I correct? Okay. When I say that? I'm only sharing this because the statute of limitations has expired. <laughs> But yeah, I was that guy. I did a lot of silly things and 
promoted the sport and met a lot of nice people along the way. Chuck Liddell came to two of our events. Thank God he didn't fight in it, but uh, his guys did. And uh, yeah, that was, it was crazy. Joe Charles. Oh, 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 wait, 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 you had mentioned Chuck Liddell from the pit. WEC, one of the owners currently UFC, I think he might be relations. Yeah. Scott Adams fought Jay Martinez yeah. on one of your events. Yes. He, the, Jay fought Tito once and he also fought uh, Scott. At, Scott was a friend of mine before all this because of wrestling. I knew Scott from back in the day. Okay. And did Genki Sudo ever fight for you? Yes. Genki Sudo fought in one of my events. Boss Rutten told me that he was an amateur and he, oh, he lives in the gym and he's just here from Japan learning. And he took one of my guys for a ride. Holy shit. He come in with the pageantry, you know, his you entrance. Know, he just came in and just, I was like, uh oh, <laughs> uh oh. I knew he was he was legit. Yeah, Genki's movements so unique. Uh, it, it was. He's Those a guys, fantastic study. He throws you off, you know. In yeah. those early shows, I had, um, of course, Genki pseudo fought. Chuck Liddell was there, but I also had uh, um, Frank Shamrock and Jerry Bolander came to one of my fights. And we were like, hey, we need you to judge this. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and <laughs> they just literally pointed to the winner. And the winner is, and they would point to the guy. and <laughs> That guy right it. there. <laughs> All right. So your school started at San Gabriel, or was – at San Gabriel High School. Garvey, it started actually at Garvey School and the Boys and Girls Club. Okay. And then and I, I talked to a couple former students of yours. And they had said at the high school, you had to pretend that you were going there for anything other than mixed martial arts practice. And you walked with your head down. You didn't say anything to anybody. And if people came in to, visit, like, to see what was going on, we had to start wrestling. Like the MMA had to stop and we had to start wrestling. And this was your place of employment. Like you're literally risking your, your, your job. Is there truth to yeah. this? Anything for a buck, huh? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because when we were doing that, it was the gym, it's, it's upstairs and it's a big group. It's a, you know, you could put two 40 by 40 mats side by side. So we had a lot of people there. We had, you know, Herb Dean. We had a lot of really Man. good guys, good people there training with us. Joe Camacho, Charlie Valencia. And it was funny because Charlie Valencia's son was like two or three years old, riding his little pedal bike around the gym while we were practicing. And then last year he won state in the junior college. Um, wow. Grown man now. And he, he would come and ride his little little big wheel around the gym that's funny yeah and not only is that wild but when um you also wrestled for the national team greco-roman national team not greco i i i wrestled on a on a, Cal a southern california team that traveled to um we went that year to canada and uh to uh to holland and it was like it was a great it was a great experience. And then two years later, I was on another South Southern California team that went to Mexico. And uh, from that team, I came home, washed my clothes. The next day, I flew out to Korea with another team and wrestled in Korea. And that was Man. eighty-five was when I wrestled in the Europe team. I had just turned twenty-one, and to be honest. Like I was struggling with wrestling, the you know when I joined in high school, and as soon as I started to get good, here I am in junior college. I kind of struggled in junior college, and then around the time I did my second year of junior college is when people started to notice I was getting better, and I felt it. I would go to freestyle tournaments, and I would place in all the tournaments I went to, and that was unusual. And I was starting to come on, come along, and. You know, so I had good experiences with wrestling. It, it was a, you know, I stuck with it and got better at it. And, and um, it, you know, I, I enjoyed my time. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, that, that's something you put the time in. You know, that, that's for sure. So let's go back to refereeing in your roots. Okay. We're going to fast forward a little bit, talk about Rumble on the Rock. BJ Penn, you repped his fight mm. with uh, on Rumble on the Rock number four against Takenori Gomi. Gomi. So BJ leaves the UFC to pursue greatness, goes to Rumble on the Rock, and, and you're the referee. What was well, that like from, from your perspective? It, it was great. Uh, BJ and uh, and JD and and the brother RJ and the parents treated me like royalty. Nice. I swear to God, they treated me like gold. They were wonderful hosts. And uh, I had met BJ in the UFC, of course, when he fought um, f- um, Kauruno. Kauno, it, twice. It was that 13 second knockout. Yeah. And um, and then when I saw him when he fought for the title against uh Jens Pulver oh. in Connecticut um for the title, when he, he lost to Jens at that time, that's when his brother told me that they were planning this and they had asked John McCarthy to do it, but um I guess it the they weren't offering enough money to do it, so it got passed on to me. So I treated it as a, a couple of bucks and a free vacation. And and it, it was a great experience, man. I loved it. I refed all those fights, Rumble on the Rock. Okay. Do you think that hurt you, refing that fight? How so? Well, for instance, they go to John McCarthy. He says, no, it's not enough money. There's probably some politics there. Uh, BJ is uh, bumping heads with the UFC, wanting to do his own thing. And they pull you into an event with an investor from Japan. Obviously, the, the pens were kind of the people giving the push. Well, that came later. The, the, the thing with Japan came later. That was a K-1 okay. fight. Yes. That, that was like a co-production. But the, the, three, the three Rumble on the Rock fights were pure Rumble on the Rock. No, no outside investors. In fact, Rich, um, I forget his last name, works for uh, Bellator now. He was one of the, he was involved in the Rumble on the Rocks. And okay. um, what, what happened was Dana White was at one of the Rumble on the Rocks. And I think really? it was the one with, if, I think it was the one where he fought um, Rodrigo Gracie. And Gil Castillo fought uh, Verissimo. And Verissimo put it on Gil pretty good. But Dana was there. And I remember talking to Dana and he was cool with it. You know, no problem. There was no issues. And, uh, you know, he, he made a comment. He thought the show was pretty good, you know. And, but he was actually in the audience. Okay, so BJ Penn beats Matt Hughes. And then he tries to fight the best in multiple weight divisions. But <laughs> that doesn't include the UFC. Actually, that came first. Um the most, right. Okay, what happened was through was, Rumble on the Rock, he went to Japan and he right. fought um, at heavyweight. He fought... Uh, Didn't he fight Louis and Machida? Yeah, Machida. Yeah. yeah, he fought Machida and he fought... I think he fought Rich Franklin, if I'm not mistaken. Was it Rich uh, Franklin? Or? Uh, I think so. Uh, no. Machida fought Rich Franklin, but BJ Penn did not. Okay. Mach- BJ Penn Machida fought... Machida screwed up Franklin's contract. Like he, they yeah. signed Franklin to like a slave contract after that. They, you know, the, the thing with BJ was he was, you know, he was fighting when he fought Rodrigo, he beat him fair and square. When he fought Gomi, he put it on him. It was probably his, one of his highlights. And then, um, uh, he fought, fought Henzo and he fought I, Henzo. Then he fought Henzo in the K one. And that was there was a little drama with that one. Uh, that was a K one fight, and they wanted me to wear the blue, like the shirt you have on with the bow tie. You know the K one refs come out. Yeah. Uh, so he gave me a Japanese large shirt, and I'm like, "This isn't going to work." <laughs> and he said, oh, you must wear it. And I go, "Dude, trust me." And I, he says, "No, put it on." And like the buttons were coming up, opening up, and I said, "Check this out." And I kind of flexed my back, and it just ripped. I told you. So that the drama actually came with uh you know Henzo is 
just a nice, he was just relaxed, nice guy. He was in the back. I think his brothers were a little more intense <laughs> and, and health. They were a little more, they're kind of scary guys. But Henzo, I'm kind of going over the rules. He's like, yeah, no problem. It's all good. Yeah, I understand. The, the question that the Gracie camp had was, was I going to allow it to be like a K-1 fight and do a lot of stand-ups? They didn't want that. So when I brought it back to BJ's camp, they were like, no, give them what they want. Don't let us, let us settle it. So unbeknownst to the promoter of the K-1 fight, he didn't really appreciate me doing that. I let them go. I didn't do stand-ups. I let them go. And, um, you know, you have the whole Gracie contingent, Hoist Gracie, Hicks on, uh, High on, Half, Henzo. It's the scariest. We're all there. So I'm like, not going to tell them no. You know, no. I'm like, Mike Tyson was in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and BJ was just intense, man. He was just, you know, slapping his face and just, he was, Henzo was relaxed and BJ was just, holy shit, you know. A little scary because BJ just like he tells me he's willing to die and he starts crying. I'm like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> BJ. So I, 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 the only thing I was worried about was like a, a a hidden choke, you know, like in the mix. There's a choke in there that I'm not aware of or it's not happening. So I asked BJ, if I do this to your hand, what are you going to do back to me? And he squeezes it. I said, good. So if I do this to your hand, what are you going to do to me? He's going to squeeze it back. I go, good, BJ, now pretend you're me. Squeeze my hand. And he squeezed my hand, and I didn't do nothing. He, I said, do it again. And he squeezed it again. I go, now, if you're the ref, what are you going to do? Stop the fight. Hey, we're, we understand each other. So we, we came fair. to it. It's fair. Yeah, you know, because I, this is, uh, you know, at the time it wasn't, I can't say it was sanctioned. Other than, by, other than K1, there was, I remember there was two guys that came up to me one time. They told me they were with the athletic commission. They were, I could smell, they, they were on, they were smoking a joint. I mean, they were, they had pot on them. They were, were like, good they were, dudes. They were good uh, what, dudes was, working for the athletic commission. But then two other guys either California or Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. And then two was other Doug guys, the bounty hunter there? Uh, you, you know what? He was at one of the fights. Yes. <laughs> he didn't like it. Man. He did not like it, but his sons loved it. And I kept in contact with them. In fact, I sent them some of my Submission Factory shirts, and in some of the episodes, they wore them. I think I remember that. That's why I asked. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you exactly. The episode where Dog <laughs> married Beth, the, I guess the daughter had died the night before one of the daughters his, that never came on the TV show. He had a daughter that was never came on the TV show. He had, all, he had a whole bunch of kids. And she died in a, I believe, a car accident the night before. Jesus. So he was talking to his son, the um, Dwayne Jr., the big one, and he's wearing my Submission Factory shirt. And nice. I, that second it happened, I was like, "Holy shit!" And next thing you know, my phone went off the hook. Everyone, hey, are you watching Dog the Bounty Hunter? He's got your shirt on. And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I saw it." <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. So. Haru Tanikawa. That's the K1 Haru. guy. What was your experience with him as a promoter? Was that the K1 fight? It was. The Rumble okay, on the Rock. That's the owner of the K1, correct? Kind of older yes. gentleman? Yes. He he was okay with me. Uh, there was a little drama. Uh, Alan Goez, before anyone, you know, they were going into the ring to warm up, and as he walked up, he misstepped on the wooden steps and he fell directly on his rib and he hit hard Okay. and he was in obvious pain, but he was going to fight. And I told him, Alan, I, I, you can't fight. And he was, I'm going to fight. And I go, Alan, no. I said, look it, let me touch your rib. And I barely touched him. He was in serious pain. So I told him, I said, Hey, we got to pull the fight. And he, he was like, kind of, well, he wants to fight. Let him fight. I go, no. I think he dislocated his rib. I think he broke it. I saw him fall. He fall with all his body weight on the corner of the steps, 
the wooden steps leading into the ring. He literally like misstep and just, if you can imagine just your rib coming on the corner of that step, I swear to God, man, you could ask him this, this. I was like, so he wasn't, I don't know if he thought I was a pussy or something, but I just didn't think it would be right for him to fight under those conditions. So he, right. we, we pulled, we pulled that fight. And then I think another fight got pulled. that had nothing to do with, and then me leaving him on the ground so they could settle their differences, Henzo and, and BJ. I think he was hoping for more stand-ups. And um, it's one of those things, man. I, I, you know, the integrity of these, you know, I know the history and I know where Henzo was coming from on this and BJ was willing to give him what he wanted. BJ wanted to beat, beat him at his own game, basically. You know, it was important to both of them. So, so you and Haru, loved it. you and Haru didn't see eye to eye. Then. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, he was cool with me, but I know he wasn't exactly 100% happy because of those two things. Other than that, about, he was fine. How about the people that he surrounded himself with? I didn't really deal with them. The only guy was uh, the, the head referee from the K1. At the time, a uh, uh, skinnier Japanese guy, he was mad because I, was, I wasn't I was going to wear the shirt. Okay. And I said, dude, it doesn't fit me. He goes, try it on. It's, it's, it's extra large. I go, yeah, extra large Japan. You got to give me an extra large. You got to give me a large sumo. And uh, he, he, I, I, knew, I could just tell, you know, when you open a shirt, you know it's not going to fit you. Yeah. The shirt, it looked just like the shirt you have on right now. Same mm-hmm. color, it just had the bow tie. Right. And I, I like, are you kidding? My wrist didn't even, my wrist totally came out of the shirt. And I just flexed really hard and it just tore right up the back. Right. right. See, yeah, situation settled. All right, dude, I like to eat, you know. One of, there's certain instances in MMA where you get to see the true grit of a fighter, really what they're made of. And even in a loss, you walk away with a ton of respect for them. And on January 20th, 2006, you were the referee for Butterbean versus Cabbage. Oh. On Rumble on the Rock. It is one of the most savage fights and, and it, I, I'll set the table for you. In essence, Butterbean said, he's training an American top team. Yeah, you know, I know my submissions aren't that good. He's taking me down. He knows he's taking me down. And if he says he's not taking me down, he's a liar. Cabbage responds, I guarantee I don't take him down. You got my word on it. Would you mind telling our audience, because it's unforgettable what took place in that bout? Once again, there was no athletic commission involved in this. So they were given, I, I can't remember if it was 30 second ground time. Like in other words, regardless of what was happening on the ground, after a certain amount of time, it was an automatic standup. And these were special rules, not a fixed thing. You know what I mean? Right. It wasn't something that there was a fix on it. They both agreed to this and this. they even announced it. I believe Bruce Buffer was the announcer and he announced it as a special rules uh, fight with, you know, mostly stand up. It wasn't like the Kimbo thing. This was something that was prearranged in order to make this fight happen. And I let it go. You know, I had, I, we went by it and Butterbean eventually got the worst and I, you know, it hurt me just to, you know, cabbage just kind of like put his head on my shoulder. And I'm like, dude, you put your head up. Hold your head high. You're, you're a friggin' warrior, dude. So these two are going back and forth, trading like Butterbean. I, it's unfortunate he gets an un... He, a lot of people kind of like to poke fun at him because of his gimmick. The guy was a friggin' savage, and he could hit really hard. And at one point during the exchanges, mm. Cabbage connects with a heavy right, overhand right. Butterbean says, wait, 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 almost like a timeout. Cabbage obliges. Butterbean takes his mouthpiece out and starts spitting shards of his teeth out. Puts his mouthpiece back in. They touch gloves again. And Butterbean ended up knocking Cabbage out. I- yeah. They they were they made an agreement to bang. 
it was prearranged. It was in the program. And, you know, there, there was a lot of things that, you know, like the thing that happened with Kimbo and um, when he got knocked out, they, they made then, and the, the company folded uh, elite XC. Was it elite XC? Yes. Yes. Um, that was a bad thing. That was, they paid, that was something arranged in the back last minute because of the, the pullout of Ken Shamrock, you know, Ken got hurt and couldn't fight in the show and they scrambled and they got on, uh, God, I forget his name who fought him. Uh, oh God, dude. I'm, I'm having a, 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 a Seth Putrazelli. Seth. Yes. And you know, Seth was up against a cage. He threw one good hook and then put it on him and he went down and they stopped the fight. And, you know, they paid him to bang, basically. I know Dana had a lot to say about that, even to this day. But uh, that was, when it's something like that, and the promoter's trying to, you know, I don't want to be a part of it. This was something that was a previously arranged. Well, th there were zero takedown attempts as well. So even if it wasn't arranged, it's not like you participated because neither guy attempted a single takedown. No, but there was a ruling that it was only a certain amount of time on the ground. And okay. I guess there was someone keeping time. I think it was like 30 seconds. To, yeah. Something like that. I don't know. 30 a minute to 30 seconds. I don't know, but I don't remember. But there was a, an arrangement and it was previously arranged and we honored it. Both sides honored it. I honored it. It was it was in the program. It was announced. That's it. That's I've been it. in programs where, okay, this is a grappling match, exhibition, no striking, and okay, I'm reffing it. You know, it's previously arranged in that way, and it's on the up and up. And if, you know, now that I work with athletic commissions, I only take guidance from athletic commissions. If the athletic commission tells me, hey, they're going to do a grappling match, okay, I'll judge it. Hey, they're only going to do um, whatever – the athletic commission allows me to do, I'll do it. Right. Right. So Butterbean, ladies and gentlemen, if you listen to this podcast, you obviously have, have UFC fight pass. You have to watch. They fought twice. You have to watch this. It's amazing. Let's talk about your UFC debut. It was UFC 34, November 2nd, 2001. It was in Las Vegas. How do you talk us through the phone call? How, how will you find out that you're actually roughing? I was supposed to do the show before that. Okay. I got a call from John McCarthy. I'll never forget this because you're ready to step up to the big time. So what? He says, you want to come over to the UFC, do some work, do a fight for the UFC. I'm like, oh, at the time I had a big commitment with King in the Cage. So um, I had asked for permission for that. I didn't have to, but I did ask because I felt the sense of loyalty. And uh, the trade-off was Terry wanted John to come and ref one of his undercard fights. In other words, I was going to, I was Terry's head guy at the time and they're going to take me to the UFC to do an undercard fight and it would minimize Terry's show. That was the thought process, I believe. And it didn't work out. I didn't ref that short show and I was really like, damn it. I may have made a major career decision that, but, they brought me on the next show and Terry, you know, totally cool with it. And, um, I, that's why I started doing multiple shows. When okay. I first came in, John had was nothing but gracious, very man answers your questions. I'd ask questions, John, what, what, you know, boom, boom, boom. He answers your questions and he, he, uh, and his wife, you know, I'd spend time with both of them and they're both just about the show. You know, John's handing out gloves and his wife's helping her. And I'm watching the process. You know, I'm learning. And my first fight was actually Frank Mir and Roberto Traven. And Frank Mir had got Roberto Traven in an arm bar and broke his arm. Okay, so the shocking thing about that, 1999 gold medal absolute winner, Roberto Traven, is up against Frank Mir, and Frank Mir breaks his arm. That's your first UFC fight. My very first UFC fight. <laughs> now, let's talk about your second UFC fight. 
Kauno versus BJ Penn. What a fight. <laughs> that, that, that's still a highlight reel. And sometimes my kids will see it and they're like, coach, you were on the U. I go, yeah, you didn't know that. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, that was great. I, I think I swooped in right in the nick of time, you know, BJ Penn. Funny, if you're looking at that view going straight towards Corona's face in the background of for Tita. The for yes, yes, he's, he's like, what, what, what's going on? What do you do? Like, I think they were upset that I stopped it at first. They thought that you screwed up. Okay, just so everyone at home can follow along, BJ Penn rushes across the, the ring. Cal Uno, he's so quick, Cal Uno doesn't even get a chance to get out of his own corner. And BJ hits him with like a 35 piece. <laughs> Actually, what had happened, Cal Uno ran out and did a jump kick. Oh, oh my, my fault. BJ sidestepped it. Sidestep, turn around. Yes. Took him to BJ towards BJ's corner. Yes. And uh, yes. put it on him. And then runs out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Runs out and doesn't do the post fight interview. Alvin has left the building. So the Fertita, you see one of the Fertitas like through the cage, just kind of like, no, no. You know, like they, they thought it was like a, a screw up. So you get a broken arm and a flash knockout, like a super quick knockout in your only two fights. It's like, it's like baptism by fire. Pretty incredible. Yeah. What were the conversations like afterward in regards to it? Did they understand that you did the right thing? Um, I swear, as, as God is my witness, Dana White came into the cage. Congratulated BJ Penn. And said and i don't remember the exact words he says i had doubts about you but that was a great stoppage and i was like wow wow that was that made my moment you know the accolades aren't necessary but it's really nice to hear and um yeah i was on after that yeah yeah in fact, you become a regular January 11, 2002, UFC 35. Um, you get Eugene Jackson, Keith Roquel, Chuck Liddell, Amar Suluev, Enrico Rodriguez, and Jeff Monson. Jeff Monson. Those yeah. are the three bouts you roughed. And, and to be honest, though, Dana did have a little, and it was professional criticism. He wasn't mad. He had told me that he felt I stopped the Monson fight a little too soon. And, you know, I, I take both sides into consideration when, you know, you, you, you tell me, and it was, I, I took it as professional, constructive criticism. He said it in a nice way. Um, and, um, okay, you know, I'm kind of gauging the whole thing. You know, I had no real training towards this. So, um, you know, now you go through the classes, Herb, John, they have their classes and, there are two, three day classes and you got to take a test. And I didn't have all that. I just got in there and just started judging, roughing. Yeah. 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 Mm. And what about Amar Suluev? Uh, did you have any interactions with him outside of the cage? Um, no, he was kind of cool. There was another guy that was a devil team, something red devil team. Red devils. Yeah. Russian. Red and devils. there was another guy. That fought that night, and he was totally cool with me. And they even gave me a T-shirt. They really? were like, "Hey, we're the referee," and they gave me a T-shirt. And I, and solos, he was cool. I know he got into some trouble later in life. Well, and, ladies and, I and gentlemen, Amar Suluev, I fantastic Google search. That's all I'm going to tell you. Fantastic Google search. Yeah, so I, there's been a couple of people where they have some fantastic Google searches. Yeah. I, I remember Jeff Monson he, as well. Jeff Monson yeah. as well. <laughs> but I remember, uh, I think it was a second or third fight after that uh, show, he fought uh, Phil Baroni, and he did that illegal knee to Phil Baroni while he was grounded. And um, I know Phil like kind of like taunted him after because Phil ended up beating him. Well, here, we had Phil on you know, before he went to Mexico and has found himself in illegal issues he's in right now. Yeah. 
And in that interview, all right, so I'm like, I mean, based on our questions, you can see I'm a little psychotic with the research. So Phil almost gets into a fight in the elevator with Gilbert Evel. Now, we also had Gilbert Evel on who confirmed this. At weigh-ins, him and Evel almost went at it. And it's just like, you've got two sticks of dynamite and both have got very, very quick fuses. Somehow they didn't, you know, fight at that moment. And Phil said that the taunting of Suluev was in part due to him almost getting into a fist fight with his corners at weigh-ins. Yeah, I, that I, I, I heard that. I wasn't yeah. at the weigh-ins, but <clears throat> um, I knew there was a little bit of heat and Phil taunting him. And um, I, I know that could have gone ugly, but, you know, those emotions kick in and, you know, I, I, you know thousands of millions of people watching it's 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 yeah i've i've seen some characters good and bad yes yes your next ufc is ufc 36 march 22nd 2002 one of the fights on the card i don't think it gets its due respect you've got matt sarah versus kelly delonte you obviously refereed that oh, kelly delonte yeah. was frank shamrock's top student and then you've got Matt Sarah in Henzo Gracie's top student. So yeah. you've got two <clears throat> obvious living legends having their students fight each other. Yeah, you know, thing when things like that come to you know come together, it can get pretty heated as well. Yeah, I, I think Matt is always prepared to fight, and you know, he's a good sportsman, but he's you know, he's there to fight. He's business, he's not gonna. You know, he's, 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 he brings it. Matt Sarah is a, is an intense guy, but yeah. outside the cage, I have nothing but love and respect for him. I happened to be in New York. I was a personal trainer, a strength and conditioning coach for a, a boxer that uh, his name was Daniel Ponce de Leon. And he fought a uh, Yerxes Gamboa in Atlantic city. And okay. I got to that fight was streamed because it was a fight in Russia that we had to wait that had to finish before they showed that fight. And that was a De La Hoya and Aram production. Okay. So my guy, Daniel Ponce de Leon, um, they asked for a 12 round fight because he's a puncher. And uh, York sees they didn't feel punched hard enough. But I happened to run into Matt Sarah on Atlantic City because there was a there was a the night before there was a I forget the name of the show. Matt was there and I walked up to him and it had been a few years since I'd seen him. And he was at the K1 fight also. And he was like, hey, Larry, how you doing? He was totally gracious. And we chatted for quite a while and he was making me laugh. And, you know, that was the night before the boxing show. And um, both were in Atlantic City. And I've had nothing but good experiences with Matt. He's walked right up to me and just started chit-chatting with me. And, um, I, I, you know, in the case, though, I, he means business. Don't get in his way. I will say at one point, he was so far ahead of everybody else in regards to applying jiu-jitsu yeah. into mixed martial arts where he was – it took people – maybe two years to catch up to him once they did they were able to you know surpass matt matt also he was odometer had a lot of miles on him but at one point i truly believe pound for pound he was probably the greatest complete fighter in the world matt matt surprised people when he fought uh george st pierre the first time yeah they never known him to have hands and i'm like where do you get that from i mean you know even when he was in the the ultimate fighter show he was spending a lot of time with his hands because his jiu-jitsu is tight. It's good. It's he, I think he got, he got into a little tiff with Mark Lehman. And I think Mark, Matt, so was Matt Hughes is trying to get something going between them. Just joking around. Hey, why don't you guys roll? And he's like, aren't you pet monkey? You know, and he's Matt Lehman just here to collect the check. And he got into that big old thing. Yeah. And Matt, well, all he wants to do when he comes is box. 
And he's like, you're not going to teach me nothing. And I'm like, well, that's the smart thing. He's there to work on his, what would most likely be his weakest skill. Not that he's weak at it, but compared to his jujitsu, I would say, yeah, it's a good bet. Work your hands, spend the extra time on your hand. And it paid off. Look what he did to George St. Pierre. Yeah. I mean, George St. Pierre, obviously a master on the ground, but George is also you know, very calculated. He's not going to, although he has the ability to beat people at their strengths, let's see what the unknown is, you know, their hands, something we haven't seen. And um, that was very impressive. Very, very impressive. Also on that card, we had Matt Lindlin versus Pet Militic and Pedro Hizu versus Andre Orlovsky. Oh, both those are quite memorable. Yes. Okay. The, the first thing I want to address is um, the Matt Lindlin and uh, – Pat, Pat fight. He, here's what happened. Pat felt he was bullied. Uh, and this was coming from his camp and from him that he was forced to move up in weight from 170. Well, I would agree with that. We had Pat on the show. He yeah. broke it down. And not only that, he was also forced to retire at a time where his body for sure was falling apart but he was also operating at a higher level than when he was at his peak. So go ahead. I apologize. No, you you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, he expressed his disconcern with that fight and his corner guys kind of said the same thing. And I believe it was, uh, Jens Pulver and, um, Jeremy um, Horn, Jeremy Horn. They, they yeah. kind of broke it down to me. And, uh, Pat got into a, a bad position with Matt Lindland. He was mount. Matt Lindland was mounted and was putting it down. He turned to his side, closed his eyes, covered up. And I told him, if you cover up in a position like that where you're taking strikes, that's not an intelligent defense. And if you go through herbs and John's training, that's one of the things they express is that you can't just turtle up, cover up, and hope it all goes away with your eyes closed. It's not considered an intelligent defense. No, for sure. Just it's like the ostrich I'm going defense. By what I'm, I'm going by what I'm taught by John. No. And at the time, John was the person giving me the info. So I stopped the fight. And I know there was a, I forget the guy's name, Hester, the guy who ran the, the grappling magazine. He blasted okay. me. I mean, he even came down and said, I was for shit for stopping that fight. And everybody else said, no, even Jens was like, yeah, you did the right thing. They weren't happy about it, but they were like, he, 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 he wasn't Pat, getting out of that position. I, I no, watched Pat even, Pat even told me that. And, you know, for, for a person to admit that they were just not, you know, that you stopped their, you know, that's, that's saying a lot. It's not like he said, dude, you shouldn't have stopped it. He hey, told Larry. Me Hey. Larry, let's let me just say, can you turn a little bit of a light on, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, I'm trying but, to right now. Yeah, I noticed if, that. If, if you've got a silver medalist hips down on top of you <laughs> and, and you're against the cage on the other side, you're not getting up. Like for about the next seven or eight days, you're going to be in that position unless somebody steps in. Yeah. And not to not to say, you know, it has nothing to do with Pat being, you know, because Todd was it Todd Hester, uh, the the grappling magazine. He was the one that really laid into me after the fight. He was like chastising me, and I'm like, dude, everybody else thought it was a great stoppage. Now Matt, Pat's a legend, and oh, dude, I guarantee, yes, I I agree with you, he is a legend. But he could have a bad day in the office, and it was my responsibility to do the right thing. And that was the time to do the right thing. And I, I'm, I stand by it. He could, he could hate me to this day, but I stand by that. All right. So this was in like 2002 and granted the press in 2002 of mixed martial art, much more knowledgeable, much more competent than the press today by leaps and bounds. But you've got a fan you're having an issue with, not somebody you know, a fan that happens to be somebody in the press corps. You know, that's that, yeah. that, that's it. And then Pedro Hizzo, Andre Orlovsky. Oh. Pedro, one of my favorite interviews that we've ever done, Pedro Hizzo. He was legend. In my opinion, the most underrated 
guy who never became the champion. He, wait, 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 stop, stop, Larry, hold on. I think we've got a bromance happening. Continue, please. Go ahead. Touch the screen. Touch the screen. Come on, touch the screen. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Okay. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, and, and uh, I actually had a decent relationship with him because he did a seminar for my uh, um, my fighters prior to that. So he already knew me. Him and Marco Huas came and did a seminar for my fighters. So And Frank Shamrock and Guy Metzger had done one. So I used to bring fighters in to do seminars for my guys. And uh, Pedro, wow. I, 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 and I personally think Arlovsky is a tough, especially then, Dude, tough son is, of a bitch with is, that last punch. This is peak Arlovsky. This is Arlovsky. Oh with the like the back hair on his traps like that was like where his power came from before, once he shaved that he had yeah. some issues but dude andre arlovsky at this moment was just he's one of the best in the world and people always say greatest person ever to have a strap around their waist you have to strap around their waist they always say gray maynard we did a two-hour yeah. interview with uh with pedro Hizzo where our sole intent was to make the argument that it's actually him and not Gray. And we had Pedro in tears towards the end. And it's, I truly believe it. One of the greatest fighters never to wear, you know, never have the UFC strap. I I stopped that fight and our loss, I'll never forget. He kind of looked up at me. He had blood <laughs> in his eyes and I saw physical pain. He was in pain. He, the look he gave, he just looked up at me. And I was like, oh, I think that was a good stoppage. <laughs> oh. No doubt about this one. Yeah. Yeah. So oftentimes fighters, they kind of have a mantra, go mar marching to the cage where they have, you know, some sort of idiosyncrasy to kind of get them ready for, for battle. Do you as a referee have that same type of process? I've had to learn to calm down. You know, I'm a okay. big fan of the sport. And I've, like, it, before the BJ Penn fight, when he fought Caruno, you see me kind of jumping around. I'm trying to shake out the nerves. Um, I've yes. learned to, like, not care. I've really, I've been on the good end of press and the real bad end of press. And I've come to the conclusion, like, you know, I do do a good job. If you want to nitpick this, that, and this, you know, after a couple of, close to what a thousand something fights you haven't seen things i've done were 100 percent on point and if you think you could do a better job just walk in and do it you're out of your mind yeah it's some people have luck some people you know just and i've learned the lessons i've learned along the way i brought back to my students and taught them you know herb was a project of mine i was like Oh, Herb. So talking about Herb Dean. Herb Dean. That's correct. Hey, okay. don't, don't, next time we do this, don't do this and do this. And, and I learned the hard way. So I went and I, I, I shared my information with him because he was kind of still under my wing at the time. And uh, when it came to, uh, <clears throat> like, I, I want to say, like, the, the Jeff Monson fight with Rico Rodriguez the mouthpiece had came out. And in the middle of the fight, I stopped it and I shoved it right back in his mouth and let him go. And then in between rounds, once in a while, John McCarthy would kind of call me over to the edge of the cage and say, hey, you're doing a great job. Keep moving. Or, hey, you're doing great. How do you feel? This time he calls me over. He looks, he has a scary look. He looks you right in the eye. And he, don't you ever, can you see my finger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't you ever. That's exactly how it looked. Don't you ever pick up a mouthpiece off the floor and shove it in someone's mouth. And he told me the process. And I was like, shit, that's the first time anyone ever told me that. I didn't know. So when I got home, I was like, hey, Herb, next time a mouthpiece comes out of the mouth, make sure you take it. You know, I told him what the procedure was. Got to learn, live and learn. Monson would do that as a stall tactic. Probably. I, yeah. I'm not accusing him of nothing. Yeah. So you do. Yeah, that's, that's, that's on you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that. 
Um, from there, obviously you're rolling UFC 37, May 10th, 2002. A fight that I, I believe belongs in the UFC Hall of Fame is what you open with, and that's Robbie Lawler versus Aaron Riley. Oh, yeah, that was in Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Kelly Delaney, right? Delunty. Del- Cal- I think it's Kelly Delaney. Is it Delaney? Delunty? Okay. Dude, I'm, I'm from the South Side, you know? <laughs> he had lost a fight to um, Dwayne Ludwig just prior to that in King of the Cage. And um, Robbie was a person that I had kind of seen in the background at these shows with with Pat Militich. And, you know, of course, I seen him on the, the, the Best Damn Sports Show 37 and a half. But um, Robbie was a guy, you know, he's in good shape, looked good. And, man, he just, his name just, he just got out there on that show. You know, he showed who he was. Who he was. He bullied him. Aaron Riley's ability to take a punch. Yes, you're right. Aaron Riley. Aaron Riley's ability to take a punch in that fight was shocking. And the undercard fight absolutely stole the show that night. Like it was yeah. a rock'em sock'em with a guy like getting stunned repeatedly. Aaron Riley is, Ooh. if you yeah. look at his independent grind career, it is Hall of Fame worthy based on the opponents he fought, Steve Berger as well. But it was two guys that, probably should have met in hook and shoot joe silva stole the fight over there fantastic one um on top of that you also referee cal uno versus eve edwards and eve ed- Penn and paul creighton paul was from uh henzo gracie school yes he does he's a jiu-jitsu god of henzo gracie's and um uh, i had uh when i ref that fight vj Wan and 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 um Matt Sarah told me I did a great job. He said, hey, you did a great job, man. That was great reffing. And I was like, wow, thank you. Um, yeah, BJ was starting to, you know, he had lost that fight to Jens. Now he was on his revenge tour. And I think he, you know, worked out some of the bugs and was just on a rampage at that point. Yeah. Yeah, he was. BJ, um, if you look at his record, it's just not very telling with what type of athlete he is. And um, pound for pound, one of the probably the top 10 greatest fighters ever to live. BJ, uh, I know like if, when you see the shows, when he's training and uh, the, um, he had some issues with training, it seemed. You know, he didn't want to put in enough work or sometimes he'd work too hard. And uh, I don't know exactly what it was, you know, as a professional <laughs> referee. Um, he, he, um, you could look back and say, oh, you should have done this. You should have done that. Well, he was there doing it. And what's going on in your mind is, you know, totally different than what we see on TV. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> like, I think, BJ was really in his best shape when he was training with uh, Mark Mar- uh, Marv Marinovich. Marinovich. So Mark Marinovich. Marv. Marv Marinovich. Uh, kind of his son played you know professional football, kind of crept out. Oh. But but his training and like his, I, I guess understanding of the human body was it was a much different approach than everybody else, and. I can't remember who we talked to. We had an interview with somebody that trained with him and they said that they still use his techniques today. And he was way ahead of his time. Yes. I, I kind of, I worked with his ex-wife. They have <laughs> another son, Michael, and he played for, he played football for Syracuse. And I worked with his wife, Jan Crawford. She was a dance instructor and Marv Renovich was a coach at USC and she was a freshman. And she has like a kind of long, lanky body. And he looked at her and said, the two of us will make the most perfect child. And like, and he was already, I think, in his late 20s, early 30s. And he just pursued her. Like by today's standards, he would have been arrested for stalking. <laughs> yeah. But it Canceled. worked. 
is the she term you're looking for. And they had a kid. And he would take the diaper off the kid, take him in the yard and roll him around in the grass, stretch him out, his hemis. And, and this is a, a newborn. This is the story she would tell me she, that he was that obsessed. When he got his grandchild, he started, stre- you know, a newborn grandchild stretching out their hemis and the groin and the crotch, you know, but doing it properly. And that's Marv. Marv had a thing that I talked to him a couple of times because of Jan, you know, I had that connection working with his wife. And he said that the, the, the range of motion in your hip flexors, your quads and your hemis are the most important thing. And he puts you through a test. You actually have to take a physical test to see how much range of motion you have. And he said, BJ was off the chart. Naturally he was off the chart because he won't train you unless you could pass his test. He, he, wow. he lets other people train you until you get to that level, and then he'll pick you up. So he, yeah, he's a he's a crazy dude. They said they got him a they got to the point where they didn't want to train in California no more. So they got him a him and his brother a house in uh, Hilo, Hawaii, and they were living on a, in a little house that they were renting. BJ was renting for him, and on the days off or the you know at nighttime, if you go by, the lights will be on. And they'd be watching fight films and taking notes. He was obsessed. He, Marv Marinovich, was always kind of categorized as, um, you know, kind, kind of aloof, somebody that, you know, doesn't know what they're talking about. You know, like in today's day and age, he'd be considered like a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> even though like, Every single thing he's talking about is not only proven to have worked, but it's effective. And like the people that were hating on him were other personal trainers or physical trainers that got degrees. And the athletes that Marv touched all just skyrocketed. And it wasn't because of steroids or any other secret mix that they're putting in water. It was just the work that that Marv put them through. Well, I think the story was he had gone to a, like after he played pro football, he'd done some boxing, wrestled, did some pro football, and he was into the weightlifting thing. And he wanted to know why the Eastern Bloc countries, like, I guess, Hungary, Bulgaria, Germany, Russia, whatever, why they were so good at, at why they were so strong and so effective in uh, the Olympics. Like wrestling. Swimming. Well, not yeah. just wrestling, but in weightlifting. Weightlifting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he went and learned their methods and came back with training methods that, you know, like like they say, sometimes they, the craziest people are the most smartest people. He's oh, obsessed. He one's wrestling. willing to make a mistake. The, the best scientists are the ones that don't play it safe. The ones that make mistakes. They have errors, but they take risks that a lot of pe- other people wouldn't do. Like you can't be a, a good scientist and have extraordinary outcomes. To be a great scientist, you've got to take risks. And it's the same mm-hmm. everywhere. At refereeing, MMA, it's everywhere. And and yeah. the thing he would say about the range of motion into the hip flexors and the hemis and the quads and all that stuff, you watch a person do lifts. Like, just say you're doing a, like a difficult one, like an overhead squat. I watch my athletes and they could barely break knees, butt level. The really good ones can get almost with a touching, touching the floor and their heels are, their feet are flat on the ground. Other people, they're like leaning forward and they get that extra stretch. You're not working the highest percentage of your muscles. You're not working the full range and therefore you're not developing the way you should be developing. So that flexibility and all that, there's a lot to be said there. And he's a, yeah. he made a believer out of me. Oh Brilliant God, mind. he made a believer out of me. Brilliant mind. Uh, that main event featured Marillo Bustamante versus Matt Lilland. We have the fake tap, although you weren't refereeing. What was the conversations like backstage that night? I'm sure they were a little heated. Uh, it depends on who you talk to. Um. <laughs> 
I know, you know, like Randy Couture and, and, and Dan Henderson were in his corner and I wrestled with Dan Henderson on the jets, California jets back in the day. And okay. he was, he was a he wrestled at a different high school. In fact, our two high wait, schools wait. were rivals. The Jets. The Jets was that his father's program? Uh, actually, it belonged to a Bob Anderson, Bob who Anderson. was a an Olympic Olympian. wrestler. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just let me just kind of tie this up. Bobby, I knew there was a link there. I'm, I'm glad you pointed out. So Bob Anderson was the American wrestler, Olympic coach, that went to Brazil, trained in the Americana is him the re he's the one that kind of figured that move out and introduced it to the brazilians and it was just trial and error for from always being i, at I time. think the word was he went and rolled with holes gracie rolls gracie with holes okay holes the one that died and yes. uh paragliding accident he kind of uh was helping them wrestling wise and learned the submission part and they had a relationship like that when bob when i met bob he was, uh, he had coached uh, Heath Sims and uh, Dan Another Henderson. Team Quest guy, yeah. Yes, and uh, I we used to go to the to the out to um, uh, not Camarillo High School uh, over there by just past Laguna Beach. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'm not yeah. gonna be able to thank them any. San Clemente High School. That's where we were going train. And that's why I got to meet um, you know, I knew Dan before because our two schools were the were kind of rivals in CIF. In CIF, Mark Keppel won CIF in 1987, and Dan Henderson's team took fourth, third or fourth. And when we went to state, we took third and they won it. Victor okay. Valley won state. So okay. we were kind of rivals, but we were friendly rivals in the respect that when I went to go train, it was all business. And, you know, we we were cool with each other. We're still cool with each other. And, of course, Heath Sims and all that, you know, it was, it was a good relationship. Yeah. So Bob Anderson, absolute icon that doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Literally the inventor of the Americana. And um, in essence... The talks behind the stage, but let's get to that. Merle Bustamante, Matt Lindland. What, what was being said after the event? I don't I think it was one of those he didn't tap out thing, but they weren't like saying it with a lot of conviction. Like, no, he didn't tap, you know. I think they were like <laughs> not giving you eye contact. Uh, no, you know, they're kind of not a lot not of conviction. Giving you eye, they're not giving you, know, you when eye somebody contact. Somebody tells you they don't tap, they're like. I didn't freaking fucking tell, uh, you know, but they were kind of, that's the way I kind of took it. And okay. I've always had good conversations with Matt Lindland. It from where, from where I was sitting, I'm like, did he tap? And I was like, did he? And John was upset. John had to restart it. And, and Marilla was upset with John. And I, I, there was no other way around it. You know, either you're going to stand by that call and just shove it down everyone's throats and say, you know what? You tapped. I stopped it or, you know, I think now live and learn, you know. Oh, oh. Okay. What would happen today? Do you think they'd restart it again or do you think? No, shove it I down think they, I, 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 it's hard to say. That's a question you might want to say to John because he was the one that was over that situation. Me personally, I've been in a kind of similar situation. I'm like, nope, you tapped. Yes. Or you cried out in pain. Or because crying out in pain, like if you scream out while well, they got a submission on you, that's a stoppage. Yeah. And we tell people that in the rules meeting and um, not responding to things like chokes, you know, hey, you're out. And then can, can like further the, can, let me just kind of anybody that listens to this show, it's usually like we get a person and they listen to all their interviews. So I'm going to kind of repeat something here. Big John McCarthy and Team Quest. Team Quest, they ran a lot of game on John. And it can't, it comes back to like Pedro Hizzo, Randall Gortor won. Pedro Hizzo's about to finish uh, Randy Coulter, about to finish him. Big John stops it so the referee or so the doctor could check out the cuts, 
while Hizu is about to finish, stops the actual action. While the, the, the doctor's checking to cut, Dan Henderson sneaks in and is talking to Randy underneath and draws Randy down, buying more time because the doctor's got to repeatedly ask to see the cuts, at which time they should have just called the fight. But it gives Randy like an extra minute and advice from his corner that's underneath them. And then Randy gets, Randy gets a takedown. That is not the the first time Dan Henderson did that. I got caught in that one with Dan Henderson. They're not allowed in the cage during doctor time. I learned a mean lesson when, when Evan Tanner fought Phil Baroni, I stopped it to also look at a cut. Yes. And, uh, Dan had came into the cage. I didn't let him in, but he came into the cage and I should have chased him out. Um, you are not allowed in the cage. I didn't open the cage. Someone okay. else did. But okay. that, but I don't want to say ca- it's a tactic, but right. it should have been stopped. All right. So Larry, we're building to that. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get to it, but we're we're gonna address this now. I'm sure in essence, know. I just told you the head referee, you get a lot of shit for this. And you've done a couple thousand fights. You're going to have moments where you really shine. And you're going to have a very, very slim amount of moments where, you know, they're, they're maybe you just didn't have a good day. But the first time I ever saw somebody full mouth getting pounded on, stop, let a doctor take a look at him rather than stopping the fight was Big John McCarthy. So the people that kind of say the same thing because in, in the Phil Baroni Evan Tanner fight that you did at the end of one of the rounds I think man from memory maybe round two first round it, it was in the first round you stopped the fight to have the doctor because that was protocol and then you start them back on their feet yeah. and it, it's not as if you made this rule up all you did was follow what it is that was set in front of you yeah. it's like you're hostage to the rule I, book. I take I take full responsibility for what I did. Yeah, I watch John and things and try and mimic because he's the best. But at that time, I didn't say, "Oh, John stopped this fight because of this, so I better stop it and check this cut." I took it upon myself to check that cut. It wasn't nothing, but the doctor had already stepped in and. I walked him to the where I supposed to walk him over to the doctor. I put Phil in the neutral corner. So I felt I fell, I followed the protocol and then restarted it. Who was to know that Evan was gonna come with that knee and then start putting it on Phil and then end the way it did? Um I take 100 percent responsibility okay. for my, well, my here, situation. Here's, here's the difference between you and other referees. Other referees at that point, they do the blame game. Any very good quasi-competent referee is going to be pointing fingers going at me. You, however, said, wait a minute, wait a minute, because Phil pushed you and took a suspension for pushing you at the end of that. He punched me. He punched you. Okay. But the difference between you and a different referee is you went to Phil's defense. You publicly stated that (laughs) let's talk about this. Like, Rather than just kind of hide and oh, I'm a victim, you didn't play the victim card at all. All you said was, I'm willing to have a conversation about this. Phil isn't entirely wrong. And do you know what came about in regards to that? A rule change, which is what was needed. What I do now, and I make sure I'm clear about this, <clears throat> is do not communicate with the referee in the middle of the fight because, and I'm not putting nothing on Phil for the situation. He, he was, a lot of people don't know. He was very sick prior to that fight. He had, um, I don't want to say like a walking pneumonia or something, but it was a congestion. He was pretty, he was in rough shape. And remember he had torn his pec muscle just a few months before. And, um, he, there was a lot of pressure for him to be in this fight. It was his first fight back when he, after he tore his pec muscle and he was sick. I knew he was sick. When the situation happened, when he was mounted, I was like, okay, you know, wow. The, the, you know, 
and Phil was yelling something at me and I couldn't hear a single word he was saying. It was loud. And um, you got a mouthpiece in your mouth. You're getting punched at the same time. I, I tell people, you may be telling me clearly, don't stop the fight. I'm fine. But with all the sound in the place, with you getting punched and a mouthpiece in your mouth, it sounds like, holy shit, get me out of here. <laughs> so I, I asked him, you want out? That's when I started dialogue. And I was like, you want out? And he, he was like, uh, I'm okay, I'm okay. Like, I, I don't hear the M part of it. I just hear, okay, okay. It was, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm okay, I'm okay. And then I said, you want out? You want out? So I was like, holy shit. And he said, yeah, yeah. And it was a total misunderstanding. I have to take the blame with that because he's trying to protect his career. I, and I, I do because... I wish I wouldn't have carried on with dialogue. His body language would have told me he was done. He was covering up. If his head was being bounced off the canvas and his eyes were rolling back, and those are my indicators to stop the fight. The verbal part, I wish I never would have engaged in it. I, I oh, Actually, I wish I never would have stopped the fight on the cut. Just let it play through because it was it, there was an insignificant cut but I couldn't tell from my angle. And yeah. I thought I was doing the right thing. But, but, but protocol at that time had you do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, like, like, like Dwayne Ludwig versus uh, Genki Sudo. Like when the referee would break it up and just kind of look and make sure everything's okay or a foul, if somebody grabbed the fence. All right, we well, grabbed the fence. We're going to start you back up on your feet right now, even though this guy worked his butt off to get you to the ground. <clears throat> there is a learning curve where things kind of get straightened out. The reason I gave that big John McCarthy example earlier was partly due, in fact, because that's what you were dealing with. It's, you're not the only one. There was a couple of situations or incidents where this takes place and, all right, is it your fault? Yeah, but what kind of percentage is it your fault? It's not a high one. It, I appreciate that, but- Well, I, that's just the truth. I, and thank you. I really do appreciate that. But I have to be critical of myself in order to get better. I have to look at the mistakes and evaluate it. And, and were, were there other options? Should I have done it this way, this way, this way? And absolutely, I wish I never would have engaged in a conversation with Phil Baroni. That was, um, like I say, his body language, his... Um, his the eyes rolling back, things like that. Had that happened, those would have been my toolbox indications to stop the fight, the things in my toolbox to utilize to stop the fight. I, I literally, with just a few seconds left, I, I stopped the fight. And I was like, oh, shit. At that moment, I, I was like, I knew I, it was a, I, I knew I was in for it. I was like, ah, okay. Now, now, let me ask you, Larry, and, and I'm not going to name any names here, but after this, you take, it's after that, and after that fight, you do UFC 46, where you've got Josh Thompson, Hermes Franca, and yeah. one of the errors that referees do, including recently Herb Dean, is sometimes rather than like stop a fight, they'll, they'll touch the fighter. And oftentimes they'll see somebody kind of recovering and then they back off. And the fight either continues, it can change. You know, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, it's like a wave, a wave will come in and then kind of go out. <clears throat> and um, after that, you, you, you got some criticism as well. But do you think there was people working really hard behind the scenes in order to kind of make sure that your job with the UFC was coming to an end? Um, not from the UFC itself and not from the, the, the Nevada State Athletic Commission. Um, I think a lot of like, like websites, um, they're, they're, I read stuff and I'm like, that didn't happen. That didn't happen that way. And I wasn't thinking that. And why, why are people coming up with these conclusions? on my actions when 
it was kind of innocent, you know, like as a, as a basketball ref, you bump into players sometimes, keep playing. A football, you knock over referees, keep playing. Um, you, you could only physically, you know, when I'm trying to get a better angle on things and I touch them, I keep fighting, you know, keep fighting, keep going. I'm not, after, if, even though I touch you and you kind of stop for a second, it, it didn't take up enough time to change the outcome of that fight. You know, you, you were, I, I even said it, keep going, keep going, you know, and you keep going. We're, there is a chance we're going to run into each other. There is a chance we're going to brush against each other or bump into each other, or I might end up to be too close where you're thinking I'm going to stop it. Your job, and I like what uh, Masvigal says, when somebody asks him, were those last punches necessary when he knocked out um, ben, Askren. Uh, ben Askren? And he says, they're absolutely necessary. My job is to keep hitting until they stop me. And I'm like, I'm like, as a referee, you're into sportsmanship and stuff, but that's actually the best way to go. You're there to fight, fight until we stop you. We'll, we'll, we'll do our job. Some people can do that knockout and walk away type of knockout. You know, other people are like, when he hits the ground, like Dan Henderson, they'll jump in the air, drop that hammer bomb. Um, You know, that's, you got to, you know, you got to protect your career and do what you got to do to, you know, because in, in those instances where you don't do it and the guy comes back to life and the fight hasn't been stopped and then you're going to regret it, you know, just, just you do your job, I'll do my job. And when I do physically pull you off, I'd appreciate it if you allow me to do my job and not continue. I brush up against you and you kind of look at me and keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting. All right. Let me just throw this out there. If you need me to edit this, I will. But there was a fight on that card between Tim Sylvia and uh, Cabbage, correct? And that was um, not the Hermes Franca fight. No, that, no, that was one before. That was one. That was in the no. That was a couple of fights before. That was actually the same fight where Phil Brony knocked out Dave Manet, yes. and okay. it was uh, the guy from Naga who refed that Kip fight. Kip Kohler. Kip Kohler. So Kip Kohler got a lot of flack because they said that he didn't stop that fight soon enough, and publicly he threw you under the bus, saying, "Well, if they're going to get rid of me, they got to get rid of Larry Landless." He, he kind of put other people's names in their mouth as well. Do you think that may have also been one of the contributing factors? Like you you mentioned websites and stuff like that. Kip was also very involved with mixedmartialarts.com yeah. at that time. Um, do you think there was almost kind of like a campaign to kind of start fires elsewhere in order to kind of clear him? I, I think very highly of Kip. As a person, he, he runs the NAG organization, does a great job. Great job. Um, what happened with him and the UFC, I have not, I have no, I had nothing to do with that. Okay. Well, their feelings on the matter was their feelings. Um, I felt a little indifferent. I felt, well, you're in there, you see something I don't see. It seemed a little excessive, but it wasn't grossly obsessive to the point where somebody was seriously injured. Um I, I was a little disappointed when he threw my name in there with Phil Brony and Evan Tanner. I mean, Phil Brony and uh, Dave Manet. Dave Manet, because I pretty much got in there as quick as possible. And uh, I don't, you know, I think stopping it after the first two, three flurries would not have been a good choice. I think Phil's hands were traveling as I was moving in and Dave was done. Well, I, he, Dave also had never been stopped up until this point, was a former yeah. champion. And I, I mean, you hate to say there's there's two different rules for people, but a guy like Dave Benet, who's a proven survivor, you kind of you kind of got to give him the benefit of the doubt until you can't. I, I don't like to critique referees, but mostly because of things like that. It sounds like it comes across to me as people trying to uh, assassin, lower the bar so that they can 
spirit. You know, being the same, you know, I was in a good position with the UFC. And actually they they were, I know they were, I knew they were upset with Kip at the time, which I had absolutely nothing to do with. I had no say. In fact, I had no um, opinion on it when it was being discussed. It was just something said in the wind. And I, I, didn't, I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I, that's not my business. Um, I, I feel there's been other people that have tried to assassinate me character-wise for things that you know, I see it on the internet. I used to watch that all the time. I try not to watch it no more. But there'd be sites where people would kind of start up things and there'd be defenses for me and then there'd be the other things. And, and it was like, the, 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 the point of origin where people, there were some people that were trying to get into this business. And I started to spot them because Herb was the first guy I brought in. And the way it worked out with Herb was I, I was doing 20 something fights in a night and Herb was just checking the raps in the background. You're talking at, at King of the Cage. King of the Cage. And I told Terry, I said, I can't do that many fights and wait, wait. I shouldn't. You, but let me just kind of tie up my end. If there's a jiu-jitsu Hall of Fame here, Kip Kohler absolutely is a first ballot Hall of Famer. That, that's my feelings on it. He had a bad night, threw somebody under the bus, probably not one of his best moments. But at the end of the day, he's provided a ton of amazing opportunities for a lot of people. I so, agree, and I, and I have a lot of respect for him. Yeah, I just, so I, just don't want, I was disappointed when my name came up like, Wow. I, I just don't want people to get kind of confused to where I'm kind of gunning. Absolutely not. Th those are my true feelings. So, so go ahead. In regards to King of the Cage, Herb Dean, you bring him in as a referee. And that was the second King of the Cage fight. And uh, <clears throat> Terry was reluctant. And he says, well, he could do the undercard fights. And he did stuff. Did, and Herb never complained. And then as time went on, I would give him a couple more fights. And then other people started jumping on board. And not to mention names, but there were these some guys who just kind of came on and they were quick, fast talkers. So I started to divide the fights up and I said, OK, Herb's my Herb's proven himself. So I gave him an equal amount of fights. And one guy told me one time, he goes, hey, can you give me a a, a, te a television fight? I go, what? He goes, I need a television fight. So, you know, people. I, I said, I never heard anybody, you know, when I went to the UFC, they gave me my assignments and I just took them. I didn't say, Hey, Ooh, can I have this guy? Or can I have the, the finals or can I have the main event? Can I have the co-main event? I never, ever, ever called a commissioner. There's been people that have called commissioners that like they're, they talk to them two, three weeks in advance and Hey buddy, how's it going? And this has happened with past commissioners and stuff. And, a lot of uh, networking. I've never did that. I've never, when I even do a show, like an Indian reservation show, or when I went to Hawaii, after the third Rumble on the Rock show, um, Rude Boy was one of the uh, referees, and he was making the assignments. And I was like the main ref. And I'm like, ah, yeah, that'll make that cool. He wanted to ref the Anderson Silva fight against the Japanese guy, the disqualification fight. And I'm like, yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. Do it. You know, it never bothered me not having been in the limelight or there was a time where I was kind of enjoying the, the limelight. And then I, after thinking things through in my career, I thought, you know what? I don't, I just want to work. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to, I just want to work. I just want to just, I know I have a lot to offer the sport. I know like when I go to these amateur shows, the, the um, camel shows in California, I'm, I'm a leader and they look to me for leadership. I, I talk to the other reps and, you know, I try and teach them and critique them in a way that, that they don't regret. In fact, in all the years I was doing the camel shows, I had to write one guy up because he was just completely horrible. And John McCarthy is the one that told me this. When we used to write these evaluations on the referees, there's a scale of one to, one to five, five being best. And, I, and then you add up the score. 
And I'd always give great scores. Appearance, okay, you're a five. And you did a good job with mechanics. I'll give you a five. And so I, I was giving a couple of guys perfect scores. And John looked at me and says, there's absolutely nothing. There's absolutely no such thing as a perfect score when they're training. They have to learn something. You got to leave them something. It's true. And I was like, whoa, whoa. That was some good training on your part teaching me because I've used that as, and I try and do it as constructive criticism. I, I'll say. Well, it's hey, just to work on. You got to work on something. You know, you're never perfect. Not, not in that level. And I let them know. I've, you know, like, um, um, a good ref who goes unnoticed and he judges a lot of fights is Mike Bell. He judges okay. a lot of fights in the UFC and Bellator, and he's a good ref. But when I was doing his evaluations, I was giving him good evaluations, but I'd leave something out and I'd give him a little something. And the truth was, it was it was better than the critique. But I just left it as a way of, you know. Pushing him. Yeah, goals. Yeah. Goals. Let me ask you about July 19th, 2002, UFC 38. They're in London. Um, you get Evan oh. Tanner versus Chris Hazeman. Chris Hazeman, an obvious pioneer and legend from Australia, oh, Evan Tanner. Yeah. Who, who passed. Um, you also had Philip Miller versus James Zekic, Mark Weir versus Eugene Jackson as well. You were pretty busy that night. Yeah. One fight actually pulled out. I forgot somebody was really sick and couldn't fight. So the card was a smaller card than what we were prepared for. We weren't prepared for the last minute sickness. And I want to say it's Gil Castillo, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was either Gil Castillo or... Um, Ah, who was it? De Sosa, Tony De Sosa, or somebody was sick, couldn't fight. So when I did the fight with Evan Tanner, he put a ton of elbows on him, but the guy kept fighting back. So I kept giving him too much credit. I should have stopped that fight. <laughs> there was a point, there was probably two or three when I look back on that opportunities, I should have stopped it. But right when I was about to pull the trigger, he had shifted his hip, you know, he was fighting back and he was definitely like there, but he yeah. was, you know, he was taking a, too much punishment. I should have stopped it. I regret that fight. The Mark Weir fight. No way. I was in there quick. Okay. James Zekic uh, fought Philip Miller. Um, James Zekic has got kind of a big reputation like Mark Epstein, Lee Murray, uh, Joe Bouton. You know, there's, there's kind of like a, a list of human beings Ooh. from that country that kind of carry a lot of their notoriety. Zekic is one of them. Did you, did you get that, uh, that vibe from him? No. Uh, I'll be honest with you. When I met Lee Murray, he was like the nicest guy. He was a gracious, nice, making sure you're having a good time type of guy. Um. That group, I didn't have no issues with that group at all. But, well, they were different groups, but well, standout I, I, individuals. I, I guess when you're from England, we kind of lump you all together. <laughs> they were all nice. They were all nice people. Well, that night, you mentioned Lee Murray. He got into a fight with Tito Ortiz, I believe. I left probably me and John McCarthy, his wife, and, and I think Chuck Liddell's <laughs> girlfriend at the time. And if, if I'm not mistaken, Joe Silva... We all shared a taxi and went back to the hotel. We missed that fight by maybe five minutes. What did Seriously. you hear after? What, what were people telling you after? I went to bed because, you know, I had to catch the flight the next day and I woke up and um, I went to the downstairs restaurant to eat. <laughs> and Pat Militich was drunker than a skunk. And I think Matt Hughes, they were all, they had been drinking all night and they were all giggling and laughing. And, and uh, I saw Bo come in through the front door and he looked disheveled and he was bleeding. I'm like, oh shit, what happened? And Bo just kind of glared and walked away. Wait, wait, who is this? Bo is Tito's friend. Okay, Bo. Okay. Bo, okay. Bo is probably one of, the, he's, a, he's a little, he's kind of a short, really, He's one of Tito's best friends. He grew up with them, wrestled okay. on the high school wrestling team with them. 
Bo is probably one of the nicest guys. That fight started because Bo had jumped on Pat Militich's back and they mistook it for an attack. And um, Tony, um, I don't know, what's his name? But Bo is the guy that took about four or five punches that got knocked unconscious. His hand Bo. got ran over by a taxi. Bo. That's Bo. Okay. Okay. So the nicest guy in the whole friggin' country at the point got knocked out, whatever. And, and I, I understand Tito's, but when you turn and they faced each other, the story, you hear different stories from different people. And I definitely don't want to get into it, but um, <clears throat> it was a big misunderstanding in my opinion, yeah. a huge misunderstanding. <clears throat> and then there's alcohol involved. There's a lot of testosterone. Um, Dude, anything can happen in a situation like that. And, you know, you're not from there. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's just, it's history. What are you going to do? It's history. I, I, I wish, had I been there, I probably could have stopped all that. <laughs> you hope. You, your intent would have been, anyway. I would have right. been like, oh, no, Bo's cool. He's one of us. You know, they thought he was being attacked. And, and God, I can't remember the guy's name. He fought in a couple of UFC shows. Um, Tony Frickland. Tony Frickland. And Did I get it? He, he's the one that, yes, he's the one that ripped him off the back. And and that was just, I guess he didn't either didn't know, know Bo or recognize Bo. And that's how it all started. And Chuck just, ding, ding, time to fight. You know, and just started throwing hands in every direction. <laughs> and to what I understand, the, it was a total misunderstanding. I, I, I almost wish they could have played it out and had their fight in the cage. Definitely a lot of hype. Definitely would have been a huge fight. Who's to say who would have won? I, I hear a lot of amazing things about Lee Murray, but I also know Tito is a tough, capable kind of a yeah. bitch. Yeah, add the takedown, and it's an interesting fight, and it never happened. Well, and man, we've got a lot of people from Europe that listen to this, so I'm going to ask for forgiveness Ooh. in regards to feelings, in regards to the statement, but in regards to like wrestling and like output of, of athletes, United States, Brazil, Russia, they're right there. I would say Mexico has surpassed the United Kingdom and it's largely in part because the Mexicans fighters oftentimes will come up here, work out with the wrestlers, get a real good wrestling defense where the wrestling in like the United Kingdom, it's just, it's not a high level. It's not like. You, you look at a guy like, um, um, God, I always see his podcast. I can't think of his name. Chel Sonnen. No, from England. Bisping. Mac, uh, Bisping. The Count, Mike Bisping, yes. You want, he lived, he's lived here for quite a while. He's become a very good wrestler. Um, well, his son, too. His son is a very good Oh, yeah. I, his yeah. son was in state when I was coaching at Bishop Amat. Yeah. Our guys were wrestling at the same time. I was sitting next to him, and we were laughing and chit-chatting, on, and I was cheering his son on. You know, he's, he's, Bisping's always been good to me, very respectful. I, look at his wrestling. He, he came to America. It, it's, it's definitely improved. Okay. Leon Edwards, they're, they're first thing, they're already yelling it. Like right now, they're listening to our podcast and yelling Leon Edwards. Leon Edwards is the first person from their country that trained there in order to get where he's at. All the, like Michael Bisping, they mm. all come here. And it's not, I, I'm just trying to state facts without hurting feelings. I, I think the United Kingdom has got some of the funniest, most personable, most intelligent fighters that i have ever dealt with but the wrestling there just it's not it's just it's not there They're, they have to import some more americans and just really take it as serious as they do jujitsu and stand up i mean their stand up is top notch if you look at um the olympics freestyle and greco-roman uh russia I iraq iran um bulgaria united states these countries are at the top, and then there's, you see Japan. You don't usually see England in that equation. In yeah. fact, I can't remember 
the last time a guy from England placed in the Olympics in wrestling, either freestyle, Greco Roman. Um, college wise, I don't even think they have a college wrestling program. I don't even know if they have high school wrestling. I think they're just clubs. And uh, you can't advance with just a club scene. You, you'll yeah. never, you'll never, ever. <clears throat> have an outstanding wrestler from a country without high, grammar school, high school, college. And don't get me wrong. English fighters, there's some, I mean, when Dan Gritty. Anderson and Bisping were in the Ultimate Fighter show, I think Bisping's team actually won more matches than Dan Henderson's team. Um, so not to say they're not great fighters. They're gritty. No. I see some great uh, Who's the guy that Josh Koscheck and got into it with, and they banned him from the UFC? Uh, God, my mind's a blank today. Josh Koscheck. Well, he took the illegal knee, uh, illegal knee, and take a legal knee. I don't know why I'm uh, trying to. They call him uh, Syntex. Uh, Paul. Uh, Paul Syntex. Uh, yes. Yes. Is it Daly? Paul Daly. There you go. Um, he's a, he's a tough ass dude, but could not deal with Josh Koscheck's level of wrestling. Yeah. And that's pretty much all that Josh was able to do was wrestle him. And he just could not stop Josh Koscheck from taking him down and dealing with the grind. And if it had been a boxing match, all my money would be on him. But in the MMA fight, it was, you know, the fight was kind of one-sided to a certain extent, you know. I had heard that Japan Pro Wrestling wanted, they were trying to do a match between you and Phil Baroni in order for Phil to exact his revenge. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right after that situation happened, okay. that Monday, I came home. Phil Baroni called me and apologized, and his voice was for shit. He was, because I told you, he, he was sick, and not a lot of people knew this. He was very sick. If Phil doesn't apologize much yeah. as well. well. I mean, let's put that out there. I appreciate the fact that he took the time to apologize for what had happened. And I said, Phil, I owe you also an apology for, and I explained my reasons. And, you know, wanting to make things better, you know me, I just, God, how, you know, I felt bad for him. I felt bad. I remember looking during, like, when all this was going on, I kind of looked Kate's side and his girlfriend at the time, who was very nice to me. I, I had talked to her and been around her a couple of times. In fact, when I was with my wife at Vegas, we kind of all kind of talked and hang hung out for a minute together. And she was a sweetheart. I liked her a lot. And I remember looking at her and she was the look of disappointment towards me. I felt really bad. And uh, that I had said, you know, I apologize to you. I apologize to your girlfriend because, you know, I know she, she was upset at me. And um, I wrote an apology about that. And I remember someone on one of the websites like chastised me for apologizing to his girlfriend. They didn't know the story. They didn't know what we were all cool with each other. And yeah, he, you know, I, I hate to say this. Elite referees apologize to nobody, especially when they make mistakes. I hate to say it like that. Like you're, you're human. Like the difference between you and some of the other people is you're human and you're willing to converse mm. about, you know, possible issues where other ones they just nope nope i did nothing wrong it's like it's it's a coward's <laughs> move not to talk about it and, and you're you're being a man and people are kind of punishing you for not being a coward it's weird it was weird uh, it's the business i chose back to the question on the, yeah. on the film the wrestling thing um Don Fry was there. It was, it was UFC 40 was the, or UFC 45 was the uh, anniversary show. Mm -hmm. And Don Fry was there and he was kind of like teasing me a little bit, but Don Fry and I are totally cool. 
Don Fry is like, hey, because he was doing that Japan wrestling thing, goes, maybe we could get you a match and you guys can, you know, it's like, and I totally kind of threw it out of my head. And then I thought about it after Phil had called me and I thought, you know, maybe this is a, a way to make amends because he's not going to make money for a while. And I kind of said, hey, you know, that would you do? I was willing to do it. You know, it's 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 a fix. It's and most likely, Why not? most likely he's he's gonna he's gonna be able to get a couple in on me, you know, kind of <laughs> like a secret ha ha. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm not gonna like it, but I was willing to do it. You know, at that time I did my first pro fight with King of the Cage right after that show. And um oh, there was a lot going on before that too. Even at the fight, people were, yeah, I'll talk about that another time. But yeah. So I thought, you know, why not? I'm, I'm going to do these fights. And, I'm, you know, I left my wife and I had split up. So I had time to train and do these things. And uh, the fight was, my fight was planned like a, a few months before the Phil Baroni incident. Okay, so you, you, wait, wait, wait. So let me just kind of put everybody in the same page here. So in essence, you're refereeing where at UFC 45, you're also taking a fight on King of the Cage as a fighter rather than just a referee. Now, as a, is, this, as a is this going to be your first fight ever, or were you doing some of well, the first, crazy first stuff? Fight. I had done okay. like a little pancreas stuff, like in-house okay. stuff with people sparring and stuff. But uh, this was my first actual cage fight. And don't get me wrong. I've been a bouncer for many, many years. And, you know, Herb will tell you, and they'll, they'll – you know, people that know, they'll tell you, we've had, you know, things happen. But yeah. uh, I wasn't well, worried. You, I, I went in there. Let me let me set the table on this. I mean, I don't mean to keep cutting you off. I, it's December 6, 2003. King Lee Cage 31. Paul Castiglione is your opponent? Yes. So Paul you had that fight. Paul and Fortune passed away. He oh. he died of a, of a, I think he had a infection of some kind and passed away unfortunately he was he was tough guy i was actually the rumor was i was supposed to fight craig titus the bodybuilder and uh this guy had had trained with craig titus and ended up taking that fight uh i think terry was friends with craig titus back in michigan or whatever They, they knew each other somehow um and craig Titus had come to one of the King of the Cage fights in Vegas. And he, he was cool with me, but um, <clears throat> yeah, he was, a, I, to my understanding, it was supposed to be him, but Paul was his workout partner. He was like a power lifter, big, strong guy. And I took the fight and I was like, my head was not right. I, all this, I'd been on the internet all week for the last week and a half dealing with the, the Phil Baroni incident, I offered the fight with Phil, the wrestling thing, and he, it was an immediate shutdown. I, I'll do that shit, fuck that, you know? So, okay. Just, you know, I thought I'd offer it just in case, you know, maybe you can make a few bucks and get you through, because I knew there was a suspension coming. His suspension, um, I, I, I think, normally when you touch a referee the way he did, it's but you're getting a year. And the cameras didn't catch it, at least the UFC cameras they showed didn't catch it, um, but he only took three months. And I think it's by and large. Did you write no, a letter? Six, six months. Did you write a letter to the athletic commission in regards to it? Yes, on his I did. Behalf? Yes, that's incredible. That's incredible. I uh, I was when I was like Phil, I asked you three times, you know, because he was striking, trying to strike me from the bottom, and I was kind of holding him out of knee on top of him, and we got up, and then. Dana came in and Dana was telling him to cool down. And I was like, Phil, I asked you three fucking times. And then he hit me. Boom. And um, Dana was like, don't you ever hit a ref? And I was like, you know what? I shouldn't have provoked. I felt like I provoked it by getting close to him and telling him what I told him. Instead of walking away. Instead of just walking away, you got to be the, you know, you got to be, I, I, not that I wanted to fight Phil. Don't get me wrong. I never wanted to fight Phil. God, no. And Phil may have swung on you anyway, as well, had you walked away. Possibly. No, you, I don't know. I was right there in front of him when I'm telling you. I, Phil, I told you three fucking times, and you told me 
you know, you said, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, we're having that. And then he just swung at me. Um, I held the other guy's hand and he was right there next to me and we're like still kind of talking. I know he was upset, but you know, it's not like he punched me right there when I'm doing the yeah hand thing, you know, um, it was, you yeah, know, he went we were, through a ceremony afterward and so did you. Yeah. 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 You know, um, the little street cred on, on Phil's part, it seemed like the internet was, they were after me, man. I, everywhere I went, I was, you know, even at the fight, people were like, I, I, there was some FUs that, you know, they, there are people that some guy told me, I hope they knock you the fuck out tonight. Oh, okay. Thank you. You know, I'll try and disappoint you. You know, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's crazy as, you know, we're talking about Evan Tanner, Phil Brony. I mean, look what happened to Evan Tanner and look where Phil's at. I mean, two just absolute tragedies. I, I, man, Evan Tanner was a, was, was a heartbreaking. I, I really, we had a great conversation the day after that fight. And then after I did the apology, I know he was disappointing in me because he kind of defended me. And I've, we never got a chance to clear that up. And I felt Evan was a person that I wish I would have ran into him or somehow reached out to him. And you think people are going to live forever. And uh, I, 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 I regretted that. The part with Phil, I did my apologies. And we actually worked a couple of uh, Rumble on the Rocks together. We kind of crossed paths a few times. And it was strained. But he was gracious. In, in our interview with Phil, we did a deep dive with Phil, you know, prior to the madness, his current madness, and he, he was still pretty upset, but Phil, yeah, there's a lot that I think both of us want to say in regards to Phil, but we're trying to be professional in regards to it. Phil's not an easy person to be around, and I, I think Phil... There's a lot of wear and tear on Phil. And I think Phil today is much different than the Phil at that time. I've, I've always had good dealings with Phil. That, that situation was, was rough. Unfor like yeah. UFC 40, I was there with my wife and his girlfriend and Phil, and we were laughing and joking and people were coming up, taking pictures and taking, doing, asking for autographs from Phil. And we were teasing, I was teasing him and, his, his girlfriend was very sweet, always a very nice person. And uh, I, I, you know, it's one of those things where, <clears throat> you know, we just kind of went our ways and, you know, I, 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 whatever demons he's fighting, I hope he gets some clarity and I, 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 I can't help but wish him luck, but I know he's in a situation that's probably not, I, I, it's not I, ideal I, for anybody. It's not ideal for him. It's not ideal for his family. It's not ideal for the victim. Ideal it for sucks. Family. Yeah. It sucks for I everybody. Did. Yeah. I, I yeah. just. Wow. Well, yeah. Well. It sucks. It's. And, and you know, we're both big boxing fans. Boxing is littered with stories like this. It's Church. just our sport isn't as big and like profound as boxing. But, you know, it's, it's, these things happen. It's unfortunate. Yeah. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like sometimes I haven't seen people for a couple of years because mm -hmm. you know, I'm just doing my, the refing thing here in California. I haven't been really traveling with it, but every now and then I'll run into people and guys I've talked to 10, 15 years ago, I'll talk to them now. And I'm like, wow, I could start to see it. And I'll, I'll be honest with you when the affliction show happened, uh, Gary Goodrich lost and I was doing interviews for the fight game TV. And then if you look up one of my interviews with um, Goldberg, the professional Michael. wrestler, oh, oh, Bill. I, Bill Goldberg, I cornered him and we did an interview and during the interview of uh, Gary Goodrich walked by and hugs him, and they kind of start talking in the middle of my interview. And then he walks away and we finished our interview. And afterwards, Bill says he's starting to have, issues all right so we had 
I'm just going to be very direct here. We've been, we, we tried to get Gary Goodrich for a while. And Gary Goodrich, you think, oh, you know, legend of the sport. When you really look at his record and kind of do a fight by fight, like kind of how we're doing with you, it's incredibly impressive in regards to just the level of opponent that he consistently faced. And when we had first contacted him, he said, you know, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want, you know, any issues. And, you know, the, the last thing that we want to do is if somebody's going to look bad, we, we have one interview in the can. We will never air it because of what we had on the other end. And um, we brought in Big Cat Tom Erickson to kind of help levy and bounce it back and forth. Tom called us up afterwards saying that's the best Gary Goodrich he'd seen in years. And we got a, we got a really, really good interview with him. And it's, it's like one of the pieces that Spencer Fisher also, we got a good interview with. I, I'm trying to get Bob Alou on the phone. I'm having issues with that, but the, the guys with, you know, obvious mental issues or, you know, that are kind of failing. It's like, those are the stories I'm trying to grab before they're gone. And it's sad because I read us I read an article or, or listened to an article somewhere where they said his daughters were having a hard time with him communicating. Yeah. Uh, he's forgetting things, forgetting their names, and it's it's a shame. Um, <clears throat> I know, you know, Don Fry is friends with them, and you know, I used to speak to Don Fry quite a bit, and um, he's he alluded to those issues, I guess. Yeah. And um, that he was having problems. Um, <clears throat> my, my heart, all these guys with uh, these battle wounds, I, I, it, I think it's time we need to start to look and do something about it. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, I'm, I'm ready to retire from the school district and possibly another year. And I got a nice uh, retirement plan. And um, to to dedicate so much of your life, entertain us, and you know, almost be godlike to us, and then to end up having those issues. Yeah, I can't see it not happening because people are going to fight. We got bare knuckle boxing now. We people are going to fight. You got the slap thing going, but. I, I, I would like to see them get at least get a minimum amount of compensation, even if it's comparable to what I get through the school district. At least they could get by on it. If, that you're in the NFL, you got to have like two, two and a half, maybe three years in order to get a pension. <clears throat> if, if you've got 12 fights in the UFC, you've got a lot of wear on you. And I think that's kind of like the benchmark, in my opinion. If you got ten fights on up, you deserve a pension. Uh, you, know, you, I, put, you put the work in. I think there's going to be a lot of debate as to how much and where do you draw the line. And you know, there's people that walked in that had no business being there and shouldn't have been there. And I don't think they're entitled to. I think your pay per views and what you brought to the sport should have something to say. Um. And and I don't want it to be objectionable to an owner or to a fighter. I, I I wish there was a third party that can kind of make that happen in a way where both sides are happy, but you can never make both sides happy. I I know it's something I would like to see. I would never tell a guy like Dana White how to run his business because, like he says, if you guys know how to do it, do it fucking go out and do it just you know make it happen don't you know you know what you're getting into you, you you're signing waivers and i i i don't want to be the guy that makes him do it right i don't want to i don't you know i i just i'm cheering for everybody hopefully there something happens and if not, I'm still going to be watching UFC fights, and I think Dana's doing a great job. He's promoting some huge, big shows. He's trying to put things together, and people always giving their opinions on 
Oh, you should have done this, should have done this. And I and now I tell them the same thing Dana tells them. Go out and do it. It's harder to put on a show. Like those shows I did in the at the school, man, I was sneaking around and, you know, and then. <laughs> Being shifty. People, 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 and that was my job. I'm supposed to enforce rules. And here we are having fights on a Sunday right. on a mat, not even in a ring or a cage. And then, uh, uh, you know, my, 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 the, the thing I tell people that they come to me last minute, Oh, you should have done this. You should have, I would have done this. I didn't do it. Do it, man. Just don't you come last minute after I already took all the risks. Yeah. <laughs> you know? well, well, let me talk about a couple of risks here. So you fight, um, you know, your first bout against a giant bodybuilder. And then your next bout is, is against Tony Berg. And you close your career with Manny Rodriguez, where at the last minute, through a spinning back fist and, you know, maintain top position and, and, and win the fight. What was the reason you stopped fighting? I was told by um, Mark Ratner, who is now working with the UFC, yeah. but he was the head of the athletic commission in Nevada and he worked me a lot he he had a lot of faith in me and when the Baroni thing went down the next fight was in Vegas UFC 46 <clears throat> and there was like a press room where people from the press can go into and there'd be articles and like a press packet and there was stuff with me and there was a picture where I look even fat in one of the pictures where I'm holding my hand up for the fight where I won. And the article was negative. And it's there in the UFC press room. And I'm like, what the, are you serious? What does this have to do with that? I thought, you know, and then there was a Phil Baroni stuff up there that, you know. Do you think, do you think it was intentional that they put that in there? No, it's anything related to MMA that had, the, you know, because in my articles, Phil Baroni's mentioned and, you know, <clears throat> our names are almost synonymous for the longest time. Well, here, God forbid a referee actually has got fight experience. We definitely don't want that, right? I mean, it's just, it's, dude, I, I hate the press. I hate the UFC press corps. Um, we refer, refer to them as prostitutes. Um, they're actually <laughs> PR machines. Oh, that's you good. Know, just getting good, good seats. Yeah. They, they don't. There's supposed to be animosity between the press and the organization. They're supposed to be keeping the organization honest. That does not exist. The guy, was it Silva, the guy that owned a, a full contact fighter? Uh, Joe Gold is who you're referring to. Love yes. that guy. I thought Joe he Gold. was great. Legit. I thought he was great. In fact, when I would hold up the guy's hands, or the USC fights, you know, the people would stand in front of the cameras and stuff. I'd make a move. I'd say, hey, get out of the way so Joe could get his picture. And he shouldn't be commenting on something that he has an opinion on. The Jess Gross is a scumbag. That's my personal opinion. I, scumbag. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to, uh, Jeff didn't want to get between you guys, but nah. I'm just saying the only dealings I had with Josh in the early days were, were pretty positive. He was mad at me for yeah. one or two calls, but we sat and talked about it. And he was he was cool with me. Loretta's always been great. Um, like I said, there's been a few guys. I forget the the one that was on the internet of uh, one of the men, he just blasted me. I mean, there was stuff that wasn't even like he was he, I mean, there was some truth to everything, but there was stuff that it didn't go down that way. It didn't, it you're you're you know, you're you, I felt I he so. should have gone a second side of that argument and not just be that guy that <clears throat> kind of cheering on the, what did, what did Rico Rodriguez call him? The Cheeto eating guys on the couch. It's true. It's true. Some people just do it for the popularity. You know, they, they yeah. do it for the popularity and they, you know, at the time it was, it was popular to, just launch out at Larry Landless, you know, and he was the bad guy. And, you know, there's a lot of things I did good for the sport, not just in refing, but Larry, and, you know, I, 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 went, I was, I'm, I had before the Phil Baroni fight months before I was going to do that fight. And it was, it was, and back to the athletic commission thing, Mark Ratner's the one who told me at UFC 46, uh, 
that I couldn't have, I couldn't fight and have a pro license, a uh, refing. And I said, well, I kind of committed to this for now. And he says, why don't you take a sabbatical? And during that sabbatical, let me know when you're, when you want to come back. So here, this is a true story. So I. Rainer's a brilliant second, mind. He's a brilliant yeah. mind. I took yeah. the second fight <clears throat> and then he called me. It was during a K1 fight, a kickboxing fight in Vegas. He had me go down for some training and we were all there for some training. And it was in the UFC office, in the UFC conference room. And we were all there. Danny even walked in and looked at everybody and said, hi. And we were there for training and John was running the training, John and Doc Hamilton. And he had me, I was on the sabbatical and he had me come down for that. And then I had a couple of fights fall out in a couple of different shows. Um, I did the fight with Manny Rodriguez. That's when I had to lay my gym down. And that last week, it was on the 6th, I believe. We had already moved everything out of the gym. I, my two-year lease expired. I rolling up the mats. We had to move them into storage. And it was a mess. So I really didn't train for that fight. And, and I, I didn't feel like I really performed at my best. But also so, Manny was a black belt in jiu-jitsu. He had trained, he had been in the corners for guys like uh, Jason Lambert. Um, I believe, uh, I forget the name of his school, but the guy from Affliction and him were roommates. The guy You're talking about uh, Tom Atencio. Yes, they were roommates. They were friends. And he was connected and he trained, did a lot of jiu-jitsu and trained okay. with a lot of people. Tom Atencio trained at the body shop with Antonio McKee, somebody that I know you had a close relationship with. Um, yeah. and Antonio him. McKee, sorry about that. And uh, would Antonio. you mind describing like your relationship with Antonio? <clears throat> okay, Antonio was a. I had a when I coached back in 1987, the year we won CIF 88. I'm sorry, the year after we won CIF, we took second that year. Uh, our best wrestler was Dante Terramani, and I trained him since eighth grade. Uh, his senior year, he wrestles Antonio McKee who was ineligible up until CIF. He was grades ineligible and became <laughs> eligible. And uh, Antonio, for those of you that don't know, he's an incredible athlete. And he's got one of the strongest grips you've ever felt in your life. If he grabs your, your if he squeezes your hand, you'll feel it. He's a friggin' beast. And Antonio beat my guy, Dante. And then they wrestled at Masters in the finals, and he beat them. So we get to state, and we're both in the semifinals at two different brackets. So unfortunately, Dante was looking towards the finals and didn't catch the guy in the semis, and he lost. And Antonio wrestled in the finals and won. So over the years, you know, Antonio wrestled JC. I'd see him, say hi, whatever. And then we did a judo tournament. He happened to be there. And we were like laughing and joking around, warming up with each other. And we stayed friends. We were friends for many up to this day. And Antonio, um, if people ask him, who's the toughest guy you ever wrestled in high school? He'll, without hesitation, I'll tell you, Dante Terramani, my guy, pays okay. him the biggest tribute. So when we interviewed Antonio, <clears throat> He says a lot and yeah. he talks fast and he talks a lot. And like, it's like a 90, 10 exchange where he's speaking 90% of the time, even though there's three other people there. And the thing with Antonio is, is he says outlandish things where you're and, and like many of them, not just like occasionally, but all of them are provably true. One of which was, yeah, John Smith, I beat him. I beat him in wrestling. And, uh, you know, they were kind of asking people in the audience who wants to go with this guy. And I said, I'll do it. And I whooped him. And they were like, come on. Chill Sonnen heard it. Chill Sonnen <clears throat> does a little clip. He wants to know who was there if Antonio Smith, he, you know, he's not saying he believes it, doesn't believe it. He wants to know who was physically there. J.D. Hawkins was in a, a local a bunch wrestling. of people contacted him and said, Antonio McKee beat John Smith. I heard it. 
not too long after it happened, I heard it from several different people, and it was pretty much the same story. J.D. Hawkins was there. He, he died recently, but he was a great coach, and he was, a, I believe he was an Olympic alternate in wrestling. But J.D. Is, was an African-American guy who was built like a friggin' tank, about 100 and I think it was a 149-pounder or 136-pounder. So the workout was supposed to be J.D. got a bunch of people together to wrestle John Smith was in town and needed to roll Wanted to roll with some good guys. And JD put together this crew and Antonio McKee was one of them. And the reason I believed it is because Antonio has, I think there was a lot of bad things happening in his life early on. Man, bro, bro, there needs to be a movie about that guy's life. It prevented him from excelling. I mean, he was in jail the night before the state championships for JC. They had to bail him out so they could have him wrestle in JC and he won state. They just bailed him out. And here he was wrestling in the state finals. Um, he went through some, some period of time where there was a lot of confusion. But, and I say this enthusiastically, there was an enlightenment that came about him. Oh. Where he turned it around. Bro, 100%. And he is the most legitimately great, super cool, straight <sighs> arrow person you've ever met. And to think back to those days, those gang days and all that. Yeah, like uh, was one of the first guys that started a beeper business back when beepers first came out in Long Beach area. I would trust my children with him. I've got, Me too. I, I, I'm Chicago. I've, I think I've met him in passing one time. I've interviewed the guy twice, and I, I, I will say the respect I have for Antonio McKee is just – he's completely sober. He's focused. Dude, I, I love I the love guy. I love him. I, I, yep. I knew his son when he was a little kid and was so proud and happy to – and he's very – he is such a sweetheart with me and such a gracious guy. He, I'd be at their show. They do a show, an, an amateur show at his gym every couple of months. I always do his fights. And his son always comes up to me. You need something? You want, you know, bring me water. Dude, this is a guy that won the million dollar prize at Bellator. Yeah. He comes up and brings me, you know, a drink just because I'm sweating. And, you know, do you need anything you want me? You know, he's always looking out for me. When he was younger, he was, when he was still like a freshman or sophomore in high school, he'd be running back and forth, bringing me, you know, orange juice, yeah. water, you know. So, so Larry, we usually try to cap it off on the two hour mark. We're, we're, we hit it. Oh, and, and think about this. We haven't even touched your king of the cage years. This is just a small portion of your career. And like I've got probably a dozen outside of MMA questions that I've not hit yet. Let me just ask you one kind of controversial question. If you want to answer cool, if not, hey, it's on yeah. you. Um, fixed fights. Did you ever think that you may have refereed one? I did referee one, and I didn't know it. I refereed actually two of them that I know of for fact. Joe Charles did a show in Sherman Oaks way back in the day. Chuck Waddell was there. In fact, some guys. So the ghetto uh, man. The ghetto man, Chuck Joe walked, Charles. Yeah. Chuck walked right up to the dude. He says, hey, you got 500 bucks? I'll fight you. And the guy just looked at Chuck and walked. He was scared of the shit. But – uh. One of those fights, this this guy, he's an actor. And I guess they all went to Russia. Jordan went and he claimed that he won the championship and which was total bullshit. I forget this guy's name. He's involved in acting and he's always bragging about how he's this great fighter. During that fight, he was giving instruction to the guy. And I was heard it. Boxing it. or MMA? MMA. Okay. It was in a cage in a hotel in Sherman Oaks, a nice hotel, like a Hyatt or something. You give us the organization name. It was actually the first time King uh, Tap Out did an MMA show. They, okay. I wore their first shirt. They walked in. Charles asked me to wear the shirt to ref, and I, I wore it. I wish cool. I would have kept it. And the other one was uh, obviously the uh, Mr. Bartell or Raphael uh, – Raphael, uh, 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 what's his name? Come on, dude. With Gerald Strevin. 
Uh, oh my God, how, how do I not have this on memory? Rafael, Rafael Tori. Rafael Tori. Yeah. Okay. Rafael, his name is Rafael Bartel, but. Right, Rafael, Rafael Tori. Bartel. Okay, so. Ralph, Ralph Bartel is his real name. Bring us through it. He's a con artist that ever fucking snuck into MMA. He's a piece <clears> of shit. <throat> he, the, he did a King of the Cage fight. It's on, it's a, a, a popular video called Wet and Wild because it rained. Yes. And I okay. wore this yellow trench coat, uh, yellow raincoat. And it was just a bullshit fight. And that whole situation, I remember he was like, because Ken Shamrock had gotten to an altercation with Mark Hall. At the bathroom. Uh, by the bathroom. It was in the hallway. And uh, people were taking sides with Ken, which, yeah, she, Mark... Mark was a little out of line with saying something to Ken's wife, which I, I don't agree with. But, well, you know, I, we covered this with Vernon White and Tony Galindo, who were there at the time. We've got some crazy Lions Den interviews that we did that are unbelievable that we've covered this there. subject. So go I ahead. You were there. Okay. He okay. put it on him. He put it on him. But um, the point of it was uh, – He, Mark Bartel, um, Ralph Tory Tori. was talking about it while we were up in Calusa for a gladiator challenge or a king of the cage fight. And he's, I, I guess Mark Hall's name came up and he says, Oh, I, I wish they let me fight him. I'd kick his ass. Or I'd, I'll, I'll, I'll knock him out, I'll knock the stutter out of him or something. And I looked at him, he's wearing like leather pants and a tight black shirt, the earring, and the necklace trying to look the part. And I looked at him like, dude, you, you don't strike me as a fighter. You just don't, you know, I was like, felt like it was kind of like a, like if Mark Hall was here, I don't think you would have said that to him. I think Mark Hall has a little bit more fuck, even though Ken got the best of him that day. I don't think you would have had a chance with Mark Hall. I think he would have, I think he would have put it on you. And, um, he had made comments like that. And then I wrestled, I did a grappling tournament in, oh, what's his, uh, um, moved to Texas, um, find the UFC, um, darn it, Chris Brennan. Chris Brennan's next generation school. They had a school in Irvine or whatever. I went, competed in it. And uh, Mark Hall gets in the cage with Chris Brennan. And they're kind of rolling around. He's looking around. I remember because there were a lot of people. There was somebody there taking pictures of him rolling with Chris Brennan. And he says, Let, you know, he gets him in an arm bar. Then he sweeps Chris Brennan. I felt that was staged. And Chris obviously said it was that he just wanted, you know, like, but he didn't let Chris in on it. He was using it as part of his pub. Like, oh, look at me. I'm rolling with Chris Brennan and I'm getting him in an arm bar. And I swept him. I, you know what I mean? He was always that guy. Just so we, through our contacts, reached out to several people in law enforcement, and I got the Raphael, like the Gerald Strebent tapes when he was talking to detectives in regards to like the, the wiretap tapes. And they're they actually on our channel. We actually have them on our channel, and it's pretty interesting stuff. It's pretty, pretty heavy stuff. I'll be honest with you. If you probably were able to go to, I don't know if he's in San Quentin or whatever, but sometimes they do interviews with prisoners and stuff. You know, they allow, I, I would, I, I would say his ego is so fucking out there. I'm sure he would do it. And I might write him a letter. Him. I might write him a letter. Yeah. I, I'm not kidding. I, I think his ego is so friggin', and he would tell a, sympathetic story because he probably want to appeal to the parole board, but I think he's a bullshit artist. Uh, well, the woman that was involved got yeah, no time. Was a, she got no time. Get, she walked. Yeah. And, it, and she obviously was in on it for the insurance money. Of course. But I think she turned some state's evidence and they got the murderer. But hey, bro, bro. California is a, a red state. I mean, a blue state. Yeah, I, I don't know what that means. I live in Illinois. Our governor and mayor are friggin' amazing. 
Are you talking about Lori Lightfoot? Yeah. 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 We definitely differ on that one. <laughs> oh, dude, she's so good. You guys should have her. You guys would love oh, her. Oh, God, no. Please stay there. No, no, you would love her. You would love her. I'd like to send her. <laughs> so, anyway, sarcasm I, aside. I just, not too long ago, I got a picture with... Uh, um, God, here we go again. Dementia setting in. Um, Gavin Newsom? No, I got a picture Another with... All-star. Uh, um, Another all-star. Ohio State yeah. wrestler. He's a, he's a, a Republican... Uh, representative from uh ohio oh, yeah yeah um jim jim jordan jim jordan yeah so i took a picture with him i'll put it on my facebook page and you could uh check him out yeah, it was nice it was nice to run into him dude jim jordan beat pat smith or john smith yeah, yeah. he beat john smith the year before he wrestled in the olympics yeah and uh 1986 and then or 1987 i believe 86 or 87, and then lost to him at the Olympic trials. Yeah, so there's two people that I'm absolutely obsessed with. The one is Mark Schultz. The more I learn about Mark Schultz, the more I, I need to learn about him. And the other one is Dirty Bob Schreiber. So any of those like old school kind of like wrestlers like Jim Jordan, Pat Smith, or John, I don't know why I keep saying Pat, John Smith, um, Andre Metzger. I, I don't know why. I just, I'm, I, I hyper focus on them, and it takes me away from MMA. But you sh yeah. you should try to get a hold of Bob Anderson. I think he would ha be a wealth of knowledge. Of I, I don't have a contact for him. Um, if you contact, if you're able to get in contact with uh, Dan Henderson, call him at the gym. I'm sure he'll get you in contact okay. with him. Uh, Dan Henderson's not taking my phone call. <laughs> okay, I, well, I need to, I need to, I'm not trying to pull the curtain back. Because Dan Henderson is like one of my heroes, and I I would fanboy out with Dan mm. Henderson. <laughs> so. I'll tell you what I'll do if I ever run across anyone that I know knows him, or if I run into him, I'll try and make that contact for you. It, it, where's Bob Anderson coaching now? He's not. Oh, that's a, that's a crime. Yeah, I think he probably works with one or two people here and there. Um, I'll tell you another guy you should get a hold of, Rico Chipperelli. Okay, He's, so Rico Ch Chipperelli, we've we've deep dived all around him. Like that raw team was one of the most in, amazing groups of human beings that he put together. And you know, one of the th questions I would have is why would they exclude Mark Coleman? Like he, it was almost like he wasn't invited to the party, which started Hammer House, one of the most dominating gyms. I think it, uh, that probably had a lot to do with his loyalty to um, um, Randy Couture possibly i think that um because randy was his, their heavyweight yeah it's true and it's that true. may have something to do with it i don't think it was anything personal yeah. other than that it is uh, and then of course you know you got an iowa and ohio state guys you know well well, well then in like the rico chipperelli like if you really look at what took place with him and tom erickson tom erickson does what almost 30, i think 30 minutes with marilla bustamante <clears throat> when we interviewed Tom Erickson, he's like, yeah, I know it was boring. And he kind of gave a deflated speech at the end where I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You were in the corner doing math equations in your head with one of the greatest jujitsu practitioners in the world. And you're just defeating jujitsu size matters. You know, Coleman always says size matters and you're proving it. It's one of the greatest masterpieces of early MMA like, like that you're ever going to watch. I'm like, plus, I'm yelling at ever, Tom. When you ever like, see a guy Tom, that you're wrong. When you ever see a guy that big that can move like that? <clears throat> they he threw is. Chipperelli out of Henzo's school after that. Really? Yeah. He said, no, no, no. Right out, brother. I, I think I heard that somewhere. Yeah. I know, I know Rico, Rico Chipperelli is, you know, he beat Mark Schultz in the Olympic trials one time before Mark had to bounce back and wrestle back rico was the guy that beat him yeah and rico is one of dan gable's all-time top top 10 are you wrestlers. talking dave schultz or mark schultz mark he, schultz. Was, he beat mark the younger brother yeah he beat mark at 180 that's fucking crazy 
Yeah, no, Rico's no joke, man. The guy is a, uh, and I know he lives out here in El Segundo somewhere. He's got his own I, school, and it's like private training. I kind of stalked him in the past. Yeah, I, I know a couple of years ago he was with one kid, but father paid him to just train his kid, and he was just with his kid at went to CIF, went to state, and um, the dad, who's an old school guy like us, wrestler, paid him to just coach his kid, and that was. I think that's one of the last times I ran into Rico. Um, even though he lives out here, I, I don't I don't see him that often. Uh, Chip Pirelli was him. was also on that trip to Brazil, where they kind of screwed over Mark Schultz in regards to uh, Jungle Fight or yeah they, no no it wasn't Jungle Fight it was one of the Inakis Inokis shows oh, and they, well, they, they did a fixed fight the without Mark Schultz knowing Mark thought he was doing pro wrestling. And then the loss yeah. turns up on his record. Yeah, dude, it's, it's pretty. We, we covered that with Mark in his interview. We've had Mark on like three times. Mark, like dude, I, I, like I said, the Schultz brothers, the more I learn, it's like the more I like, I need, I need more. I need more. They're just incredible. So, Larry, we're going to have to have you back talk about. Sure. About uh, King of the Cage, your King of the Cage years beginning. Okay. I've got a shitload of other questions for you, MMA related. I hope you enjoyed this as much as we did. We're going to publish it this Monday. Okay. okay. Uh, please send me the link so I could have my kids see it, and I'll put it on our Facebook page. And 100%. 100%. Larry, absolute pleasure. And Anthony, Anthony Venti, dude, Anthony is like, I feel like I've made a friend with him. I know he's a buddy of yours. There's yeah. certain groups of guys that I go to in different regions where I kind of gather information up and I put notes down. Anthony's a wealth of knowledge and he's helped me out a lot. He's, he's helped a great me out guy. a lot. Hey, 100 percent Larry, you're the man, brother. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. We'll tie you up with the oh, All right, brother. Do Please send me that link on my on my uh text. Will do. Be good, brother. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great honor. Great, great, great talking to you. You too. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.